ladies and gentlemen, our next event of the evening is a one-fall match with a 60-minute time limit. What I'd like to have right now... Where the big boys play. This is where the big boys play, huh? This is where the big boys play. You're listening to Where the Big Boys Play, and we're here today to talk about Starcade 1985. And I'm here, I have the pleasure uh, to be here today with not only Chad, but also Brian. So uh, I guess you two should say hello to each other. <laughs> hello to each other. <laughs> um, d- d- how are you guys? Are you good? Doing good. Ready to talk about the show. Yeah, yeah, we're so, ready to do this too. Great show. I'm just praying to God my power doesn't cut out before the end of this. We got some nasty storms going through Pittsburgh. We were doing a Great American Bash uh, '85 last time, and this is uh, a few months later, uh, December, uh, November of '85. It would have been, and much like WrestleMania 2, this is coming from uh, multiple venues. So basically, every single show we've done so far has come from uh, the Greensburg Coliseum. But tonight we're coming not only from the Greensboro Coliseum, but also from the Omni, which is a couple of miles from you, Chad, right? Yeah, uh, the Omni is kind of an uh, arena that I have a lot of sentimental value with. I uh, watched a lot of WCW and WWF shows there. And actually my father-in-law and brother-in-law went to the Omni portion of the show. Wow. So you, have, you had some uh, relatives in live in attendance at the Omni. Yeah, uh, when they found out that I was a wrestling fan... Um, way back when I started dating my wife, uh, they, first thing they said was they talked about this show and basically their two most, uh, vivid memories were the Abdullah the Butcher match and the Dusty Rhodes finish. So, did they, did they end up giving you anything from it or any, uh, did they bring anything home? No, they didn't have any souvenirs or nothing, but, uh, I was kind of surprised at the amount of detail they could remember. It seems like this was just a uh, show that um, my brother-in-law would have probably been around 10 or 12 at this time. So this seems to be like a show where he was really into wrestling and kind of this was the peak of his wrestling fandom. Oh, yeah, I, I totally get that. I mean, it's so funny the, the details you remember of things at that age as compared to now where you're just kind of like, oh, there it is. Right. So was the Omni a big loss uh, for, for Atlanta when it, because it, it got demolished, right? Yeah, they they tore down the Omni and built the Phillips Arena, which is the basketball and hockey arena when we had a hockey team, uh, at the same location. Basically, kind of, I think the Omni had a lot of character. It had sort of a weird brown ceiling, uh, real 80s fluorescent seats. Oh, man, it was really close to where you really felt like you were on top of the ring, for instance, and watching wrestling there. Uh, the first show I remember from the Omni is actually Starcade 1992, which I went to, and it was just a great way to uh, watch a show. And the Phelps Arena is still not bad, but they definitely took out some of the intimacy of it, mm-hmm. and it's sort of one of the cookie-cutter arenas you see a lot of in the States. Well, well later on tonight, uh, on Pro Wrestling Only, I am going to make a thread. Uh, of, um, you know, what are the best ever uh, wrestling arenas. Um, and I reckon the Omni may be in that conversation. You, you, it, it was certainly a, um, a show, that, uh, a place where they ran a lot of shows, I know. Because at the Greensboro, as we've seen, the Greensboro Coliseum was really the home base of JCP. Um, but the Omni was kind of like the Turner's headquarters, right? Like that kind Yeah, of- I think... The more they transitioned to WCW right before um, Bischoff took over, I know he hated Atlanta. That's why he wanted to, when Starcade was in Washington and Halloween Havoc was always at the MGM Grand, he wanted to sort of drift away from Atlanta. But from kind of around this time, and especially in the 89 through 92 era, uh, the Omni was ran pretty much monthly by WCW. Yeah, and they, they would show highlights, I remember, on, like, Saturday night and uh, worldwide shows of these incredibly-looking cards, and you'd get, like, a 30-second snippet of it. I just remember sitting there going, oh, I'd love to see this whole show. When did those Disney tapings start? That was really when they started really moving away from the traditional hotbed, right? When 
Bischoff started the Disney tapings. <laughs> that was around like 93 or something. Yeah, about 94. I know in watching the yearbook, uh, we just transitioned from the Saturday night still being at center stage, which is another really cool arena in Atlanta, which still exists. Uh, but they transitioned from center stage to the MGM Disney arena. What do they do at center stage nowadays without, you know, weekly WCW shows there or other stuff? They have some concerts there. Uh, I've been to a couple concerts there. It's a really good place to see a concert, actually. The acoustics are really good. Uh, so sort of you're about, you know, kind of the 800 to 1,000 seat range people that can draw a concert. A lot of times they'll go there. It's one of the couple biggest places in Atlanta for that size. Okay, and then the other one quick thing I remember personal from Atlanta is uh, I work for a company that owns uh, a bunch of art schools across the country. One of them happens to be in Atlanta. We were down there for a conference, and I made I made us leave early so I could stop by the outside of the uh, the, uh, the headquarters, of T- the old headquarters of TBS, just to check out why I think they might have originally recorded the old Techwood Studios stuff. Yeah, that that would have been right around there. Uh, the the new headquarters are across the street. But as you're driving up, it's I-75, I-85 when they connect. Yes. You can see the old, the very first TBS building has kind of white letters TBS on the side. That would have been the original place. And center stage is right around there. Uh, oh, it's, it, right. it's it's probably a couple blocks from there, and it, it's a real nondescript building. Like it's really something you'd have to almost had pointed out to you to say that's where center stage was, but it's, it's really nice inside. It's just a dump outside. Yeah. It was just kind of cool to see the old, you know, TBS building. Just remember how much cool stuff took place in there. We, we right. Should, we should probably explain to, uh, to, to the listeners. Um, you know, some of them may not know that, uh, you know, Jay Crockett had, um, two main, uh, I guess it, they were both a shows really. They had worldwide and they had, um, what was the other show? World Championship Wrestling. Um, and one of, basically, when they took over Georgia, the Georgia territory, um, they did all of their TV from those, from, it was the World Championship Wrestling that came from the Techwood Studios, and then Worldwide would come from, I guess, f- f- footage from house shows and things. Is that right? Yeah, I know from the from the worldwide side, they would definitely there would be different house show tapings, which I love just because the the as I, I kind of mentioned at the Bass show, the the Southern fans back then were just so much noise. They were so into it. It sounded like there was forty thousand people in those buildings, and I'm sure there wasn't. Right, and that yeah, so they had the worldwide was coming from like all over the place, but World Championship Wrestling was basically you know. If you've ever seen those, uh, Rick, you know, the famous Ric Flair promos and stuff, um, with, you know, there's a very specific set. Those are the Techwood Studios. And it must have, they must have held about, what, 500 people or something? <laughs> um, if that, yeah. I would say that'd be the top end, maybe even, a, maybe a couple hundred. Yeah, it really legitimately looked like they had like 15 people, not 15, yeah. but maybe like 50 people in there. Yeah, I, w- I would say around 100, to be honest. <laughs> It kind of, I mean, it always reminds me of the old uh, USWA studio, kind of the same type. Exactly, exactly. Right, so shall we get stuck into Starkid 85? I'm Bob Cole along with Tony Schiavone. Tony, tonight professional wrestling history will be made and all of these fans across the country are a big part of it. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. It's the night you've been waiting for. It's Starkid 85. A night that we all will remember. Well, I tell you what, with the exception of a world television title, all major titles are on the line tonight, and a lot of grudges will be settled. I think we're just about ready. I think so too, Tony. Let's go. So I guess it's quite emblematic that um, they did their bigger show in these two different um, venues because it did show, kind of show Crockett in transition 
uh, from the traditional kind of home base in Charlotte to 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 Atlanta, where uh, we kind of become the center of their operations for a while. Uh, our hosts are Bob Coddle and no more Gordon Soley, as I predicted. <laughs> There's uh, it's Tony Schiavone, uh, and making a big comeback is uh, Tony's mustache um, <laughs> after an absence last year. And we've got Johnny Weaver in the interview role. Um, and there's quite a funny, uh, quite a funny moment where, the, for some reason, the camera um, doesn't have him framed properly, and it takes them a long time to realise this. And then the uh, the camera c- kind of centres on Weaver just as he's finishing up. <laughs> um, so we've got uh, Dr. Tom Miller, um, still an announcing, and he, he makes everything uh, feel like quite a big deal. Um, and Miller's in Greensboro, where we have our first match, uh, which is Sam Houston versus Krusha Khrushchev for the Mid-Atlantic title. Um, and the Mid-Atlantic title traditionally was the main title for for the Crockett territory. Um, but I guess by 1985, it kind of slipped down in importance for uh, for the promotion. Yeah, by by the middle of '86, it would be uh, it would be defended throughout '86 on television. There'd be a couple of changes, but I know by the end of this coming '86 calendar year, they would retire it for good. <clears throat> so, so this is um, Coddle uh, builds this up as a as a basically the size and strength of uh, Crusher Khrushchev versus the speed and quickness of Sam Houston, um, which is pretty much how it plays out. There's a big USA chant. Um, we, we, in fact, we did get the national anthem first, uh, which, uh, which um, I, I think possibly because the, there was a Russian in the first match. Because I noticed last time um, we had the Russians on the card. They they moved the national anthem to go right before when they were on. So um, they put it they put it first. And I, I don't think we even got a national anthem in Starcade '83. I would assume it happened before the show. I don't know if Brian goes to a lot of indie shows nowadays, but uh, down here they still do the national anthem and even a lot of times a prayer before the first match, which is kind of weird, but I guess it's a tradition. I haven't been to many around here lately. I actually have a buddy that actually took over ownership of a local one around here that some guys, I guess, that are bigger stars now had started there, but I, I haven't gone in a while. No, I have to ask you two guys because this always, uh, you know, it seems a little, uh, I don't know, a little quaint to uh, to, to me. But um, like when the national anthem plays, do you two guys immediately put your uh, hand to your heart and stand up and uh, stand proud as Americans? Is this does this happen still? I mean, everybody will stand up uh, during the playing of it, and if you're wearing a cap. Uh, everybody will remove their cap, and then it's sort of, I'd say, around here, 50-50 of physically putting your hand over your heart or just keeping it to your side. But at the very minimum, everybody will stand up and remove a cap. Yeah, pretty much the same standard fare here, too, uh, just like Chad said. Wow. You see, that is something that you guys uh, that you guys kind of do. Do it, do it big and do it in style, I guess. Um, we don't really, uh, we don't really kind of go for patriotism in the same in the same sort of way. But at least it doesn't manifest itself in the same way. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I was I'm always interested in that. Um, so here, um, Houston is looking pretty good. Uh, he, he's a, he's a fired up baby face, um, and I, I actually think he gives uh, Crusher Khrushchev a run for his money here. We, we should mention that Houston is actually the champ coming into this. Even though- a- a- actually, um, interesting you said that. There, there's a couple of interesting backstories on this. This is actually for a, the vacant Mid-Atlantic Championship. Oh, uh, Buzz Tyler was their champion in mid-'85, and he had actually defeated uh, Ron Bass. He ended up leaving um, Crockett Land due to a money dispute with uh, Dusty. Um, he actually took the Mid-Atlantic Championship belt, the one that if you've ever seen older year videos of, uh, that's there. They actually are fighting for the vacant title here, and the winner ends up getting a brand new belt. So the belt that you do see throughout the last year of it in '86 is different from the the one that I actually thought was pretty cool, the one they had in the '70s and '80s. 
Right, so, so Houston wasn't the champ coming in, or he was? No, it was for the uh, vacant Mid-Atlantic Championship was my uh, complete understanding of it. Uh, now, if they announced it that way at the show, I don't remember, but I know leading up it was a vacant championship. That actually makes more sense, because he really seemed like the underdog coming into this match. Um, in fact, has there ever been a Sam Houston match where he's not the underdog? Um, but, yeah, I thought he was pretty good. He was pretty fired up, and uh, he hits a bulldog at one point. Um, this is a decent little opener. Any thoughts? I, th- I thought this was fine. Uh, you know, nothing terrible, but nothing offensive. Uh, the finish, I thought, was a little rough, where you have the finish where Houston hits his bulldog and pins Crusher, but Crusher's foot's on the rope, and then Houston kind of acts like an idiot, starts <laughs> jumping around thinking he won, even though we don't have a bell ring or an announcement. So that was kind of stupid, but overall, I mean, it was fine for what it was. Now, is that the stupidest baby face moment we've seen so far, where he uh, celebrates as if he's won? <laughs> That's pretty stupid. Now, that, I know before, at the Starcade 84 show, we talked sort of about the difference between just, you know, a boneheaded baby face and then somebody that's, you know, not the brightest person, but sort of gets outsmarted or... A uh, heel will use a devious tactic. Yeah. This was just a stupid yeah. move. I mean, just on Houston's part, he looked like an idiot. Yeah, and, and pretty much, you see that a lot in a lot of matches where the, the, the underdog babyface will get that kind of win. What I find even worse is you have a referee standing four feet away from you saying, dude, you didn't win, and they don't even care. They're still jumping around like, yeah, I'm the champ. Yeah, but, uh, it, it does actually make uh, Houston seem like a, like, a wrestler should be aware of his opponent's foot on the rope. He should be aware of it. Yeah, it's bad from Houston all around. But I, what I have got is a big note here saying that the sickle, the massive clothesline, took Houston's head off. And I love that. I love that uh, type of clothesline where it just looks like it decapitated him. Yeah, Crusher and Nikita just had killer clotheslines back at this time. And I'm a huge mark for clotheslines, especially big ones like the sickles and I got nothing but love for that. Now, Barry Darso is pretty stacked here. Like, he's big um, at this point in his career. Does, I he, mean, he looked really thick. I mean, not not necessarily jagged as far as, you know, I mean, he was muscular, but he looked just really thick in his yeah, big, like, body type. Yeah. Like a big guy. And by, by right. the time that he smashed from demolition, he's, he's not really that big, is he? Certainly by the time he's Repo Man, I don't think of him as being a big guy. Oh, yeah. Repo Man, I would say, was a significant step down. Smash, I mean, he was still pretty big, but I did think he looked bigger here. I don't know if that was just maybe the costume being next to Axe, um, who's a big guy, too. But. <laughs> yeah, honestly, the hair has a lot to do with it. I say that from experience. I uh, don't have hair anymore. I've, uh, well, not not by choice. Nature has decided to take it away from me, so the rest of it was shaved off, and, and I kid you not, I will have friends, I'm the same size as I was without it 10 years ago, they will tell me, oh, you look heavier, or whatever, so I don't know if that has something to do with it as well, with him, uh, you know, adding hair back with the uh, Smash character. Let's not get into the word demolition, fat and gay debate that has been raging on PWO for the past uh, six months, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that one, but yeah, de- definitely he looked big here to me, Darso. Well, one other quick note about this whole match, uh, these guys will actually have what I think is a better rematch on the Saturday night TBS show in January of 1986, uh, where Houston would end up winning the Mid-Atlantic Championship and a whole melee would break loose at the end with the Russians and Dusty and some others, and Crusher would end up tearing his knee up pretty bad and uh, would be on the shelf for about six, seven months after that. So a little, a little side note following this was the fallout of this ended up Crusher on the shelf for quite a while. And Did he... Um, d- when did uh, Darso actually go to WWF? Because uh, the um, the original uh, demolition had a, had another dude there, right? Yeah, the the original demolition had uh, I can't think Moon Dog Spot. I can't think of his name right now. Chad, do you remember the name? Oh, his last name's Collie. Um, Randy Collie. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah there Collie, you go. One of the old Moon Dogs. They had him Crusher. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I know they ended up. They have the U.S. tag titles next year's Starcade, 
they're there. I believe he leaves in early '87. Got short head to the WWF. Right, okay. So he's st- he's still around for a while. He, he's just out injured for a while. Yeah, he he would come back, and him and Ivan would end up uh, doing pretty well again for a couple months. Yeah, and uh, I mean, one of the things that I've um, one of the kind of little debates that I keep on bringing up is that my personal feeling is that um, Crockett had too many belts at this time. There were just too many titles. And you know, and I, it's a legacy thing, really, because you've still got the. Because um, I, I work this out, the national titles, so the the tag national titles and the national title are overhangs from Georgia. They're the Georgia regional titles. Then you've still got all the mid mid Atlantic regional titles, um, and then you've got kind of the um, the U.S. you know the U.S. titles and the TV title and the world title. So there's actually quite a lot of singles titles that a guy could win um and i i wonder if it's you know if you guys have any thoughts about uh the worth of having the mid-atlantic title at this point because you know considering where sam houston was on the card and the fact that he's winning this uh again in a couple of uh in a couple of weeks i'm just wondering like you know how important does that make this title feel and does a guy like sam houston need that title given where he is on the card I, I mean, I think you had some oversaturation of the belts at this point with uh, the territories kind of coming smaller together and the NWA becoming more of a singular promotion. I'd like to have seen them a little bit earlier kind of get rid of some of the regional titles and just focus on the tag, television, U.S., and heavyweight title. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. But that, I think the only thing they did wrong aside when they do end up retiring these belts is they should have had some – some bigger build-up, maybe some unification matches. Like, I know in the the, the middle Atlantic title, for example, they just retire it. Um, there are some other belts that... I, I know the national and U.S. does get unified, but there's a lot of other titles. They just, you know, say they're not being defended anymore and move on. Right. But but in the end, yeah, they, they needed to cut some titles down. From the titles on this show, though, I believe two would not be there after this show... And then one would, re- and then there'd be a new one that would come up that would replace one of these. If that makes any sense. We'll get to that. Uh, okay. So, so now we um, we switch from Greensboro to the Omni. I've I've been looking and looking to, to try to figure out who this ring announcer is. Uh, I have reason to believe that the ring announcer is Roger Kent, the AWA announcer, and I try to get this verified. Um, and uh, one guy said, yes, I think this is Roger Kent. But K-Hawk, uh, the AWA kind of uh, authority, couldn't verify it for me. So uh, do you guys have any idea if this was Roger Kent? I saw you post that on PWO, and I have no idea. Yeah, I, I, have, I have no clue either. But if K-Hawk says it's not, I'm going to take him... Uh... I'm going to take his word as gospel on that because he knows his AWA. <laughs> he, he, he didn't definitely say it's not, but he said he'd, he'd be surprised. But I ha- I have reason to believe that this guy was Roger Kent. Um, but then I did pull up some images of Roger Kent, and this guy didn't really look like him. So, yeah, I, I, you know, grain of salt on that. But possibly Roger Kent is the ring announcer in the Omni. So interesting that they chose to keep uh, Tom Miller at Greensboro. But I guess he was like the regular the regular announcer at that Coliseum anyway, right? Um. So we have Manny Fernandez um, versus Abdullah the Butcher in a Mexican death match. Um, and going into this, I'm thinking, how long before Manny Fernandez uh, catches color here? Um, one thing I've noted is that uh, last time uh, Fernandez came out to uh, Michael Jackson's Beat It, um, this time he's got some soothing country music. So yeah, he's definitely changed his, uh, his theme. And uh, he's wearing a jeans and a cowboy in cowboy boots and a Mexican hat <laughs> um, and that, yeah a Mexican death match basically works like a, like a glove on a pole match right the they have to get the hat yeah this one was a sombrero on a pole match basically um, the, the funny thing about this is and if anybody has heard Manny Fernandez shoot interview you know what I'm talking about here Manny has stated in his interview and I, I really find this funny and I, I know if Manny Fernandez ever saw me he'd probably kick my ass which is fine <laughs> but he has stated in his interview that like this was the main event of Starcade, and after their match tons and tons of fans were leaving 
and, and walking out, and that him and Abby had just put on the match of the night. Well, this is the opener at the Omni. Yeah, I, I swear to you, in his uh, in his his shoot interview, he he says it just like that that this was the main event. This was the, the sh- what everybody had come to see, and people started leaving after this match. <laughs> oh God, oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah I, I I really it's if I, if I wouldn't have heard it, I never even could have made it up. But he, if you've never heard on his shoot interview, find it, listen to it. It's really it's really worth listening to. Yeah, that, that, that that's very funny. Um. Well, anyway, as predicted, he immediately catches color here. I mean, he he basically bleeds even before he steps into the ring. I mean, I I guess like um, he, he's uh, Abdullah pulls some foreign object out of his uh, out of his tights. Is this the fork? I couldn't really tell. It didn't look like the fork to me. It's usually either the fork or like the the knife. It's one of the two, like the butter knife. I always associated it with. Yeah, this looked more like kind of the blade. I thought it was kind of like the little knife. Uh, thing. Basically, sort of, this looks like a little bit longer razor blade. Yeah, so uh, Abdullah pulls this out and immediately uh, Manny looks like a mess here. Um, and then, uh, before long, he takes off his uh, one of his cowboy boots and um, starts diving from the top rope to Nail Abbey with it. And uh, he, he's pretty much, uh, it, there's a good section here where Fernandez is uh, battering Abby with the with the boot. Um, then he takes his belt off, wraps it around his fist, and um, this really pisses off Abdullah the Butcher, um, who 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 gets angry. Then uh, Fernandez hits a suplex, um, and Cardell says that Abby is 460 pounds, which actually sounds about right to me. Because uh, he's he's a big he's a big guy, um, Abdullah, and then kind of uh, Abdullah misses a shoulder charge in the, in the corner. Um, at some point, Manny Fernandez hits uh, his kind of signature flying uh, fist. Um, you know the move that you've probably seen Tito Santana do many times as well. The uh, flying burrito, the flying and this burrito. was actually called yeah, it was actually called the flying burrito, which is well, so actually racist. The flying burrito. Yeah, that's terrible. He named it though, so uh, you can't really <laughs> you can't really say too much when he's calling it that. I uh, know. I was just shocked because you know I've heard Ventura call that so many times, what? just sort of associated that well, with. I I assume that was a Ventura rip. I didn't think. Yeah, that. and so to hear this, <laughs> uh, apparently named by Manny himself, is. Was a side to behold, and then kind of Manny wins by grabbing the hat, um, which seems like after a reasonably bloody match, quite a quite a lame little finish there. But I get, I guess all those matches are kind of anticlimactic, aren't they? The object on a pole matches. It's never a very satisfying finish for me. Yeah, I mean, even with a ladder match, you kind of have a couple of wrongs on the ladder where, you know, we've seen many times where people really melt that climb for all it's worth and it ends up looking a little ridiculous. But with the thing posted on the ring post in the corner, it's kind of tough to do that because, I mean, you're essentially climbing two steps to reach it. So there's not a lot of drama you can build up for that. Oh, the thought of a 460-pound man sliding up a pole to grab a sombrero is uh, quite good enough for me. You, you know, the thing that always makes me laugh is in those Hogan cage matches where the uh, it's like the final bit to get over the cage is the hardest. Um, you know, they'll, they'll climb up it really easily. But then that last little bit is so difficult. It's almost like they have to kind of go through some massive force field to, to get over that last bit of cage there. Or when, how much they or when they get on the other side and they, you know, they're climbing down and the, the face grabs them, it's like you're looking at it like, just let go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Many times I've seen that happen. But, but yeah, I, for me, this match was not brutal enough. Um, it was bloody, but not brutal. Would you agree with that? Mm, I think I liked it better than you, Parv. I, I liked it a good bit. I thought with the time they had that it was, uh, I, I thought it was pretty intense, actually. I'm not expecting a whole lot, quite frankly, from Abdullah, except sort of a hack and slash style match. Here, he kind of 
put some intensity into it. He still looked, I would say, as a kid, you know, he, he always looked scary. He was always scary to me when I saw him, even in his 1991 run is what I associate with him first. Um, and here he had sort of that persona, and, you know, it was pretty interesting to see him do both a monkey flip and a suplex. So I actually like this match a pretty good deal. Yeah, seeing seeing uh, Manny Fernandez, you know, suplex Abdullah the Butcher, what was a sight in itself? Because from uh, stuff I've read and heard over the years, he had a problem. Abdullah wouldn't let too many people take him off his feet and suplex him. So, so for that to happen in this, I thought was was a really really good spot. And like Chad said, the rest of the match was for its time in 1985. I thought it was quite brutal enough. Okay, I'm I'm happy to be in the minority there. <laughs> yeah, I, I I guess in my mind, I think you know. Abdullah the Butcher versus the Raging Bull, Manny Fernandez, Mexican death match. You know, like in my mind, I'm thinking of like, you know, something really, really brutal. You know, something maybe on the level of uh, Piper versus Valentine or something like that. And this just kind of not at that level for me. You know, like we've, what I'm saying, I'm not really comparing this to hardcore stuff that we'd see later. I'm just comparing it... um, you know, just in terms of brutality of what we've already seen, um, and it doesn't really hit on those registers. So certainly, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't expect people to be thinking, you know, they've already seen the best match of the night by this point. They were leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, it, but this match was, I mean, like I said, with both my father-in-law and brother-in-law recalling this card. This, I mean, they talked about Dusty first. And granted, you know, they were in the Omni, so remember they were only watching Magnum TA totally match on the big screen, which I'm sure did not resonate as much as if they'd have seen it live. But this was the second match they mentioned, and, you know, pretty much anything else from the Atlanta card, they had very vague memories of besides those two matches. Right. So, well, I guess you can't argue with that. If uh, if that's the match they remember, then... Maybe Manny Fernandez was right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they walked out, but <laughs> um, so we, we we go to Johnny Weaver now, and he's with Crusher Khrushchev, who I do not think at this point is a good promo. Oh, yeah, uh, this was a bad promo. Yeah, and because uh, he's not trying to do a Russian accent or anything, because he, he's an American sympathizer, as we explained uh, last time, and. Uh, I've got a note here that Weaver doesn't seem 100% comfortable. He's definitely no mean Gene Oakland. And I got the impression that you can tell that he had somebody speaking in his ear. My uh, my wife is a, is, a, is a TV reporter, and she said it's really difficult when somebody uh, speaks into your ear, and you have to talk while somebody's talking to you. And I reckon that Johnny Weaver had not mastered this, because he, he really seems distracted by something. And I guess that, you know... He wasn't a broadcaster by profession. He was obviously a, obviously a wrestler. So, uh, yeah. Ed, ed, any any other thoughts on this uh, Khrushchev promo here? Uh, Johnny Weaver. I know he had had been doing. I know Mid Atlantic Wrestling things like that for a while on television. So it did surprise me to see him so just kind of uh, out of it, for lack of a better word, in the interview. Yeah, I, I wonder. See, one of the things I wonder is, um, is it because the Starcade shows went out live? Um, because you know it was it, we we talked time and time again how Soli and uh, Coddle didn't seem that comfortable, and then Soli you know in that studio setting with Bill Apter last time, with the uh, with the Great American Bash show seemed a lot more you know composed and within you know comfortable on screen. And I I just wonder if it's the the terror of going out live, you know, but probably when you see him on uh, on TV, he had a couple of takes there to to get it right. I wonder. Even in the early uh, WrestleManias, there were some very uncomfortable moments with uh, Lord Alfred Hayes, who at that point had been on TV, you know, for years. Um, you know, when he's standing in the aisle, he also oh, he also looked. He looked yeah, I'm sorry, he looks terrible in WrestleMania One. Lord, <laughs> good old Lord Alfred. Yeah. So <laughs> I just wonder if it's that kind of deal, you know. So we're we're back over to Greensboro uh, now, and. Now we have another gimmick match, a Texas bull rope match. Um, and I wonder, do they just make these up? Like, um, in, you know, do they have a big book of matches or do they just make it up from match to match? 
with this, the, this one actually makes sense. Um, I don't know if you want to announce what the match is, and then I can kind of... Yeah, it's, it's uh, former tag team partners, uh, Ron Bass and Black Bart. You know, both of them were, they they were all about the bull rope matches. Ron Bass, that was one of his claims to fame, was the, the bull rope match. Um, and this was kind of, Bass had still wanted to get a piece of J.J. Dillon ever since uh, his split from them earlier in 85. He, he fought Buddy Landell, as we heard, at the Bash 85. And then throughout the rest of the year, tried to basically get at Dillon. And uh, toward, towards the end of the fall, uh, Dillon decided to throw his former partner, Black Barton, his way. And um, Bart ended up attacking Ron Bass on a uh, October television match that Bass had with Tully for the United States Heavyweight Championship, which uh, ended up having them lead lead to this one. Where the stipulation is, if Bass can defeat Bart, he will get JJ in the ring finally. This is the second time I've watched this uh, show in recent um, in recent times, so I've kind of like reviewed it uh, already. And I've I've just pulled up what I've said there, and I've made a big note about the booking of this match and there's three things that I don't like about it okay so maybe um, Brian you, you may be able to uh, kind of give a counter to some of these so one if, uh, if Ron Bass get, wins he gets five minutes with J.J. Dillon as you just said so obviously Ron Bass is going to win right I mean what you, you wouldn't add that stipulation unless he was going to go over right yeah, agreed um, so I don't like that because the heel is not really um, the, the heel has to put something up for stake there. So Black Bart is putting his manager up for stake, but Ron Bass isn't putting anything up for stake. So that doesn't really seem like I I never like it where there's a stipulation where only one person has to give something. Yeah, um, I don't get a lot of the stipulations either. I don't know if the thought here is that you know JJ and Black Bart are so sure that they can get rid of their old charge that sure. You can beat my guy. I'll come in the ring for you for five minutes. You don't have a chance against my black part. It, would, it should have been something like if, uh, if Ron Bass wins, he gets five minutes with JJ. If uh, Black Bart wins, Ron Bass has to leave town. Like, I'd have been happy with that. Something or, like they that. Time, or they like time to a post and Bart and JJ can just kick the shit out of him for five minutes. Yes, or, or something. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we'll, we'll get on to my other complaints uh, in a second because they're to, to do with the actual JJ Dillon match, so... I should explain, this uh, Texas bull rope has got a cowbell attached to it, and Ron Bass makes pretty effective use of this cowbell as a weapon, and he gains the early advantage, and it's all Ron Bass to start. Black Bart turns it around eventually, and uh, eventually uh, Bass catches some color. There's a cool spot where uh, Bart dives over the rope to the outside, and there's no concrete, I noticed. There's no... Um, there's no blue pads down there. It's just concrete on the outside. I mean, th this match is just two beefy guys clubbing on each other, right? It's just two, two big brawlers having a brawl. Yeah, like Dusty would say, a lot of clubbering going on. A lot of cl clubbering, yeah. And uh, Shivani during this uh, shows this bunkhouse stampede show at the Omni in a couple of weeks, and I quite want to watch this bunkhouse stampede, but it doesn't exist on tape, so. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to get to see it. Anyway, eventually, uh, Ron Bass, obviously, um, as was obvious even before the match starts, uh, gets the three. Um, and Dylan immediately jumps on him and chokes him with the rope. But quickly, Bass gets the advantage back. Dylan begs off. Bass nails Dylan with a bell. But of course, we, we get a ref bump and uh, Black Bar interferes and Dylan gets the win. So, again, we've got a manager put over a wrestler for the second time we've seen this finish. I think the first time was, uh, was it Paul Jones got a pin over Jimmy Valiant before? Uh, am I remembering that wrong? We, we, we've definitely seen a, uh, a manager get a yeah, pin. To Paul beat Jimmy uh, because we were uh, summarizing and concluding from that that Charlie Brown would be making his triumphant return. Yeah, that's right. So Paul, we've seen Paul Jones beat, get a clean pin, well, a, 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 an assisted pin, I guess, on Jimmy Bunyan, and now we've seen J.J. Dillon get a pin on Ron Bass. Um, so th there's a few things here. Uh, the, 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 the other problem I've got is that, I mean, you know, as a guy 
brought up on uh, WF. Like, I really expect there to be a Jesse Ventura figure saying something like, oh, this guy's beating up a manager, big deal sort of thing. But you don't really have anybody making the point here that, you know, J.J. Dillon's just a manager and Ron Bass is actually peeing on him. Um, and and I, I, I guess some of the angle going into it may have explained that, but, you know, it may have explained why it's not so uh, strange to, or not so bad for Bass to be beating up on Dillon, but I, d I do miss hearing that kind of heel figure, that heel colour guy saying, you know, making the point about beating the manager. I mean, J.J. Dillon was a wrestler for a long time, so I don't know if that had something to do with the fact that they wouldn't have maybe got on it like if he was beating up Jimmy Hart. Uh, Dillon had wrestled in Texas and a bunch of, and even in, in the Mid-Atlantic area in the 70s, so I know he was a, was a known person around there, so maybe that's where they got away with, uh, yeah, you know, he's a wrestler, A, and B, he's been beating up people outside the ring constantly. Yeah, I, I, I kind of get that, but like in my in my way of thinking, that as soon as you become a manager, you kind of become like a win, right? You kind of become, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Mr. Fuji or or Jim Cornette, you're you're weak compared to a, an active wrestler. Do you know Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I get that. Does make sense. Um, and and then obviously, okay. So if if you're gonna if you're gonna do this, why have JJ go over there? Because you, you've already made. Bart look weak because Bass got the win, and then you make Bass look weak because he loses to a manager. So I I don't understand the the booking here from 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 start to finish. I, I'm kind of guessing this is pure speculation of where this you know where these guys would go the following year. The the fact that Bass is pretty much gone by the beginning of '86. If he's there, I don't know what he's doing because I don't, I don't remember hearing his name very much or at all in '86. Dylan's going to end up stepping up to a bigger role, you know, in 1986, and Bart's going to stick around, and I mean, he's going to drop down and not be of of much importance for the next eight nine months, but he's still going to be there. So I guess I get the idea at the end of these two getting the jump on Bass to beat him uh, with with them sticking around and Bass um, leaving. I don't know where he goes or if he's around for a while because I know he doesn't show up in the WWF for for a while after this. Right, so so you you actually think that this is just a method of putting Dylan over? Yeah, I mean I, that that'd be my best guess at it. Uh, like I said, especially that it, it's pretty quick after this that Dylan pretty much dumps all this and heads over. You know, gets with Tali, and you know, you know, from there the legend is born with everybody else. Chad, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I kind of agree with that. That I think basically in their mind they were just seeing the Bass Dillon section as a way for Bass to get some heat and some retribution on Dillon, but eventually to get outsmarted by him. Uh, they obviously had bigger plans for Dillon than Ron Bass or Black Bart, for that matter. I thought the uh, Black Bart-Ron Bass match was actually a lot better than I expected. Uh, these are two guys that are kind of punch-and-kick oriented, and the bull rope gimmick is one that has not had a lot of great results in a lot of matches, but I thought they used it well here, uh, using the cowbell uh, when they took the spill to the outside, they both went outside showing that, you know, they were connected together and you couldn't get any separation, so I was actually pleasantly surprised by the actual matchup uh, between Bass and Bard, I thought it was good. Yeah, I'm with Chad there. They they definitely have chemistry, being together and knowing each other as long as they had. I, it was I thought it was really good for what it was too. And, and Ron Bass can also walk away on a on a lighter side, thinking he he defeated a future world champion. I mean, granted, it was a world class champion later in '86 that had the belt handed to him in Black Park, but hey, he can say he beat a world champion. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, don't get me wrong. I actually thought the 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 match was was decent enough. It's just, it's really the booking that I have a I have an issue with here, but I guess looking at it that that way, if 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 it was their plan to put Dylan over, I I just wonder if they could have done it in a different way here than actually have the manager go over the wrestler, which which seems uh, a strange thing for me. It, it, anyway, um, we're back to the Omni now, and it's Brian's favorite, the Barbarian. Uh, oh Lord! The next ten minutes of this night is a waste of time. This is our um, where the big boys play favorite Billy Graham. <laughs> um, 
who's who's going for the hat trick of because uh, so past two shows in a row he's won um, worst uh, worst player of the night least valuable player. Um, so we're going to see if uh, Billy Graham can make it three here. But first we've got something that would make Jesse Ventura proud, an arm wrestling match. Um, Jesse Ventura must have been loving this because Billy Graham was his hero. And of course, uh, well, 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 we'll see later that he, he loved uh, he loved an arm wrestler as well. So, um, uh, yeah, an arm wrestling match between the Barbarian and Billy Graham. Um, so, it, it, anybody seen that old uh, sliced alone film, the arm wrestling film? I can't remember what it's called. Now. Oh, over the top! That's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is kind of uh, I was slightly reminded of that. Neither one of them had a hat, so, you know, so they could do the switch. If you remember from the movie, he had the hat on. He's like, when I turn my hat back around, it's like a switch. <laughs> um, Graham's back in superstar mode here, so he's he dumped the kung fu gimmick, and he's obviously a face again. Uh, yeah, Billy Graham. Billy Graham actually uh, throughout throughout late '85, he was still with Paul Jem's army, but he he did start to show some signs of a face turn, including uh, saving Paul Jones' hated Jimmy Valiant from a from an attack on the Midnight Express earlier in the year. And and as time went on, Jones grew angrier and angrier at Graham continually helping things out. And then eventually, Jones kicked him out, kicked him out of the group. Uh, Graham came back as the superstar and uh, took tried to get one last shot at glory, I guess. You know, you know, if I was Paul Jones, I would have fired him. Um, basically, the second after the Great American Bash '85 was over, because he 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 got pinned by Sam Houston. I mean, if I was his manager, I would have been like, "Look, Billy, you know, things aren't going well here. You, you're going to have to uh, start pulling your weight, otherwise you're you're out of the you're you're out of this heel stable." <laughs> uh, Unless Paul Jones wanted to learn karate, you know, Billy Graham could teach him that. <laughs> um. So, yeah, what, what did you think of this arm wrestling type segment? How, how did it rank there? You know, d- d- this is kind of one of those segments like, uh, you know, Dino Bravo does some weights or, you know, like a like a pose down challenge. Or, you know, this is one of those sort of uh, sections, something to get the crowd uh, hyped. Reasonably effective as one of those. Chad? I, I mean, I thought... I thought it was okay. Uh, I mean, I thought Graham looked better doing that than what we've seen him do so far, which admittedly is not saying much because him looking halfway competent is better than what we've seen so far. Uh, But here, you know, I mean, the crowd was kind of into it. And, I mean, it's a basic premise that, you know, every single one of these things will occur where either, you know, the – the heel will get the early advantage and the baby face will overcome and either win outright like you saw here or, you know, the heel will cheat and do something in order to win. So, I mean, was it a waste of time? Probably, but it wasn't as terrible as the other Billy Graham stuff we'd seen. I actually thought that Graham looked in slightly better shape here. than. Uh... Yeah, I, I thought his face looked younger. I don't know if it was just the way he had his kind of goatee, his signature goatee and the tie-dye, but uh, he did look in better shape, tanner. Um, he, he looked healthier. His cycle must have been on at that time. I guess. <laughs> so, um... After this match is uh, after this arm wrestling match is over, they then ha- ha- have an actual match as well. Um, so that was a little bit. Str- if they just left it at the arm wrestling match, and then maybe uh, you know Barbarian gives him a give a, gives him a kind of heel beat down, that would have been decent as a little segment, I think. But then they actually have to have a match as well, um, which Barbarian really just controls. Uh, until he misses a leg drop, um, then he misses a, uh, a splash, and uh, Graham gets a bear hug uh, set in. And then, with our first uh, really crap finish of the night, Jones jumps in with a cane and uh, tags Graham for an instant DQ. And I've just written, what the hell was that? Yeah, I mean, and, and Graham has the barbarian and a bear hug. You should figure one of the guys you trust to be in your army could get out of a bear hug or not quit. So I, I didn't like the ending of that either with Paul Jones running in and, you know, 
the whole thing to me was just not very pleasing. Just they're just wasting to me. They're wasting the barbarian here in a match against Billy Graham. I don't know why they didn't take another one of Jones' charges and put him in here. Yeah, and I'm also upset with the uh, kind of managerial acumen of Jones. This is a terrible decision to jump in and DQ. I mean, not only is it the barbarian and the bear hug, but it's you know this guy who's got the barbarian and a bear hug got pinned by Sam Houston a few <laughs> a couple of months ago. So like he's not posing the greatest threat in the world. I don't understand. Like there's just no reason to jump up and uh, hit him with a the cane there. Absolutely pointless. What well, what would actually happen? Does Graham stick around for a while here? When, when does he go back up north? Is it is this for, is this is this it for Graham? I'm, I'm fairly certain. Certain. Yeah, I'm fairly certain it is too. He doesn't show up back in WWF. I think until late '86. I want to think. I could be wrong on that date, but I, he's not around in '86 in Crockett Land. Not at all. Right. Okay. And when he when he is back with uh, Don Morocco, he's got Kane, right? He like he can barely walk. Well, well he he they, he comes back. They they do a bunch of vignettes where he's in the desert talking about he's coming back. He comes back. He, he wrestles either very little or not at all, and then he ends up needing um, hip surgery. Um, they end up going through that. He has hip surgery. He's gone for a while. They show his recovery. He comes back, gets into a quick feud with. Um, the one man gang and Butch Reed before Butch Reed and Billy Graham basically take him out for good and put him on the shelf and into retirement. Right, and then he goes on to be the worst commentator of all time. Oh yes. Okay, so thankfully that's Thank it for Billy Graham. Uh, actually, not not as sad as as we we've seen him. Slightly better showing from him. Um, we're back to Greensboro. Chad, any any final thoughts on uh, Billy Graham? <laughs> no, uh, kind of glad this is the end of the road of him for him, and uh, I, I I really do this this to me this finish is just probably the most frustrating thing for me on the night because they had to have seen the writing on the wall with Billy Graham uh, that at best he was a nostalgia act here, uh, so to make the Barbarian look fairly weak. Um, was a terrible decision. Yeah, and you probably haven't had a chance to to, to listen to the uh, Great American Bash show yet because it's, it's only been up like a few hours. But um, at, on that, Brian was going on about how much he absolutely loves uh, the Barbarian. Did, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, on Barb? Yeah, I, I actually listened to that. Uh, the Barbarian. I mean, I, I agreed with Brian that you just didn't see. Uh, kind of the nimbleness for a guy his size very often um, in this era. Uh, so I thought, you know, even through uh, through his WWF run, they could have done a good deal more with him. Uh, kind of wasted opportunity. Yeah, yeah and you, all these years the man gets uh, like one world title shot on a big show, and that's in 92. Yeah, I mean, he definitely could have had a run with Hogan, um, 87, 88. You know, when he came in in 88, that would have been great. Oh, he, he was tailor-made for that, too. I, I don't know why he was just wasted for so long. Yeah. Or, or even in the Zeus role. I mean, you had Zeus in that role uh, in the summer of 89, and somebody like the Barbarian would have been great in that role. So someone had to carry the Warlord, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, go back to Greensboro. And uh, we've got Terry Taylor uh, versus Buddy Landell. And um, J.J. Dillon is not yet uh, not yet with Buddy Landell. Of course, uh, Landell, Dillon's favorite at this point. Um, and this is actually a match for the NWA national title, uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, is the main, it's kind of the main title from the Georgia region, uh, from the Georgia territory. Um, so and that would be that's the same is true of the uh, the Andersons belts, right? The the national tag team titles was from the Georgia area as well, I think. Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, obviously, Ollie Anderson had a had a stake in that area for a long time too. Um, Shivani shells this uh, bunkhouse uh, show yet again, and I'm actually wondering if this was some sort of tour, like this was a tour of house shows uh, in January '86, I think. These are uh, bunkhouse stampedes. 
I don't know if you can answer that chat or not down your way. I, I only remember them, the Stampedes. I know in 87, they were a, like a series of bunkhouse battle royals. And then the winners of all these would face in like a main event. Yeah, I think that's kind of what they did for sort of a, a few years. Kind of is kind of, I don't know, in a lot of ways, I guess like the Great American Bash would make its tour during the summer. And then you'd have the bunkhouse stampede. Uh, and kind of the December, January time frame, um, where, yeah, essentially you'd have all these matches, and then in the end, it'd be sort of a cage match at the end with all the competitors. Yeah. Okay, so so you'd almost have like a bunkhouse stampede winner, like you'd have a Royal Rumble winner. or a... I, I mean, to me, it sort of reminds me of sort of the Battle Bowl concept. Yeah, the Battle Bowl, you yeah. Know, with yeah, you'd have sort of your preliminary matches, and then all the winners would come in at the end in sort of the the main event, so to speak. Yeah, and, and who who like uh, I haven't uh, I haven't got it open here, but do you any idea on, on on who won those? I'd imagine Dusty. You got yeah, it. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I'd right. imagine Dusty was pretty much. Uh, at a high, high winnage percentage in those matches. I, I think he won all three of them that I know of, 86, 87, and 88. Um, a local thing in Pittsburgh, I'm sure it wasn't national news, but in 87, I know Bubba, Big Bubba and Dusty had tied for the um, Bunkhouse Stampede, and they had a final cage match here at the Civic Arena to decide the true bunkhouse winner. It was just a regular house show, but they kind of, they hyped up a little bit on te- television with Jim Crockett coming on TV and saying, oh, you guys are going to fight in a cage, you know, decide the real winner. But of course, Dusty won. Yeah, of course. I, I, you just mentioned Jim Crockett there. You know, whenever I see him on TV, he is one of the least charismatic men. Like, he makes, uh, he makes Jack Tunney look like, uh, look like somebody with charisma to me. It's unbelievable that Jim Crockett and David Crockett are brothers, just from the difference of them on television alone. Yeah. And and I just looked it up, and your Bunkhouse Stampede winners, 85 Dusty Rhodes, 86 Dusty Rhodes, 87 Dusty Rhodes, and 88 Dusty Rhodes. Undefeated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So it's a clean sweep. Well, you know, people moan about Hogan winning those early rumbles. You know, well, there you go. Um, yeah. So uh, this is Taylor versus Landau. We get a we get a mixture of smart mat work and nice strikes to to start with here, um, and Landell hits. Um, <laughs> there's a really nice uh, spot uh, near the start of this match where Landell hits Taylor so hard he hurts his own hand. <laughs> that really amused me. Um, uh, after a while, uh, JJ Dillon wanders out and he's all bandaged up uh, after his victory. We got a nice leg drop from Taylor, some uh, stiff chops from Taylor. Uh, this is a pretty good back and forth match. I, I really quite enjoyed this. Um, you know, as a, as a regular wrestling match, there's a lot of gimmick matches on these shows, and uh, this was just some good, you know, good old fashioned wrestling here. Uh, we get a decent suplex from Taylor at one point as well. Um, Coddle and Shivani mentioned that uh, the superplex is really the move that. Uh, Taylor's looking to set up here. That's his big finisher. Um, eventually, uh, Dylan uh, gets up on the apron. We get a ref bump. Um, Taylor Irish whips Landell into Dylan. Uh, he gets the uh, well. He sets him up for the superplex, um, but Dylan trips uh, Taylor, and Landell falls on top of him from the superplex uh, position to get the three. And I really like that finish. I thought it was a really neat, uh, nice little story there. And I really like this match. I'm pretty high on this match. So, uh, any uh, chaps? I love this match. I really do. To me, this is probably my favorite match on here. I, I love, you know, regular, technical, almost what people consider boring wrestling today. I love it. Uh, just good in-ring work. You know, both these guys could go. Uh, Buddy Landell is one of the most underachieving wrestlers ever. Um no fault of his own, obviously, and in, uh, I've heard interviews with him enough where he'll admit that. But he, he's he's just really, really good at what he does in the ring, and, and I still think he has the greatest non-top rope elbow drop in the history of wrestling. 
Chad? Um, I, I mean, I think I'm a little bit lower on this match than both of you guys. I liked it. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I did really like the finish. I thought that made Dylan look smart and being able to grab the uh, Taylor's foot in sort of a Rick Rude Ultimate Warrior WrestleMania 5 moment. Uh, but it, it looked really good the way Landale landed right on top of him from the superplex position. Uh, th- I thought the beginning kind of went a little bit too much back and forth, uh, but I thought the placement of this match was really good because uh, you had brawls, uh, a good many brawls and gimmick matches before this, and you'd have a good many brawls and gimmick matches kind of after this. So this was nice placement to have just sort of a straight-up wrestling match in the middle of this card. Uh, so good match. Yeah, and then sadly after this, uh, Buddy Landell wouldn't even be around much longer. He'd be booted out of uh, Crockett Land soon for some of his demons, and uh, Dusty would take that title, surprise, um, uh, going into 86. Yeah, it, 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 let, I, we do see Landell a little bit later, so we can get into that uh, when we see him again. I think he comes out for a promo, so we'll... we'll uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so, we're back to the Omni now. I think we're switching back and forth. Uh, and we get the national tag champs, Ole and Arn Anderson, and they're taking on Wahoo McDaniel uh, and an absolutely ripped and stacked Billy Jack Haynes. Um, Who were the Florida United States tag team champions? Yeah, talk about overkill on titles here. Like, oh, um, this should have been some sort of unification match or something. Or they should exactly. Or they shouldn't have brought those belts out because it was confusing with so many guys, uh, so many different titles. Um, so yeah, I, I've said this before. I'd have thought that Ole and Arm would have bigger fish to fry, but clearly not. They're still uh, still defending those national tag championships. Um, and we get a nice uh, shine section to start as uh, Haynes and Wahoo knock Ole around. Um, and I've just uh, got a note here that Ole Anderson does sell when he wants to. So because he's always a, he's one of those guys who's always accused of not giving his opponents anything. Um, but you know he bounced around for Wahoo and uh, Haynes here. Yeah, I mean Arn's always known as a guy that's a great taking sort of pinball bumps in a tag match, but Ole matched him here. One thing I wanted to ask was. Uh, I watched a 24-7 version of this show, and I, I was kind of wondering about the theme music. Uh, I would assume that they just dubbed, it sounded like they dubbed in their own, uh, you know, generic theme music. But for this matchup, Wahoo and Billy Jack came out to an instrumental version of the song 1999 by Prince on the 24-7 version, which... <laughs> Again, yeah. that kind of got into the uh, the assassin footloose uh, oh. kind of situation where it just seemed very bizarre. So I don't know if they used the actual song by Prince as their theme music or used something else. That's one thing I was sort of wondering about. You, you know, Chad, now you mention it, I watched the 24-7 version and it's just occurred to me that probably Manny Fernandez did come out to beat it again and they just dubbed over that generic country track. Yeah, because yeah. I, I know Dusty, later on, Dusty comes out. To, that was when, because this, I thought, you know, I mean, it was such a blatant, you know, just instrumental karaoke type version of the song 1999. So I was sort of like, oh, they may just not pay for royalties or somebody, you know, got wise or got a threatening letter. So they just did this. But yeah, Dusty clearly in the main event comes out to some just terrible generic, kind of bunkhouse style music so that made me wonder like what the other theme music was for on the live show yeah i saw the 24 7 version here as well on this one because the uh, that's where we're very very hard tapes to find are the original versions of this and i don't, I don't think i've ever seen I'm sure it's out there i've never seen a good copy of the uh the satellite version of this yeah yeah i, I, I always loved w w uh f e's thinking like they always think Southern wrestler will uh, will give them generic Southern music. Like they they really do think in that way, don't they? <laughs> um, yeah, Dusty's music was awful. <laughs> Dusty's real music wasn't much better. It's, uh, that, that, is that, that, that is true. That is true. 
I can't even hum it. It's just that there's no music to it. It's just kind of like a small bass line with a little bit of synthesizer in it. I hated it. Yeah, it's not very great either. Um, it, anyway, uh, Arn regains control, and uh, Wahoo is playing a uh, face in peril here for us. Um, and the uh, Andersons focus on Wahoo's arm, which is uh, pretty neat, I thought, given that he injured his arm. Um, like I, I can't remember who it was. Who, who, uh, I think it was um, Orton and uh, Orton and Slater who took out Wahoo's arm in '83. <laughs> so. Um, Clearly, like the Andersons have done their homework here and knew to work on Wahoo's arm, or maybe I'm just reading into it. Uh, that that's what they were thinking. But uh, the good thing is, it's also Wahoo's main arm, you know, where he does his his big chop with. So yeah. that was some good psychology there as I well. The commentators pick up that they're trying to take out his chopping arm, um, and obviously, it's tip- this is typical kind of Minnesota wrecking crew stuff: tags in and out, focusing on the arm. Um, and I could watch uh, Arn Anderson work all day, really. Um, he does a little bit of his, uh, what I describe as staggered drunk selling uh, of Wahoo's chops here. Um, yeah, that only Arn Anderson can do, really. What do you guys think of that kind of staggered drunk style selling? <laughs> do, 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 um, do you know what I mean? I mean, that? yeah, I mean, I, I would, a lot of times I know it's sort of referred to as sort of stooging kind of selling. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I like it. I do think it's definitely Southern in style uh, and it's backbone. Uh, so that may, I may be biased in that regard and I've just grown up with it and seen it so much, but I, I think Anderson is one of the masters of it. He does it well. And he actually, like I mentioned earlier, he does mix it up with some of his sort of pinballing type selling where he'll just, you know, take a huge bump off of some shots also. Yeah. Um, so Wahoo gets the hot tag to, to Haynes, uh, and he clears house. But the comeback is pretty um, pretty short-lived as Haynes tags Wahoo back in. And I've just written what. I never understand it when a guy gets the hot tag and then tags the guy who's just been getting punished back in after like a minute or something, which is what Haynes does here. Um, on uh, Irish Whips Wahoo, um, Ollie on the outside trips him, which was quite neat, and then they do it again, but this time Ollie uh, holds the leg for the pin. Now if I was Wahoo McDaniels uh, here, I would be absolutely pissed at Billy Jack Haynes. Like, wh- what's he doing? Like, why are you tagging me back in after I've just, you know, I've just got my ass kicked for the past five minutes, so I don't want to be back in the ring. Yeah, he tags him back in. Any thoughts? Yeah, I thought the, I thought the work uh, by the Andersons was really good. Uh, Billy Jack's hot tag was, I mean, it was okay, but not exceptional. And then, yeah, like you said, we get a, a quick tag back into Wahoo. And then the one thing that I didn't like was the finish was uh, in a lot of ways very, very similar to the previous match where you had, you know, the baby face getting tripped up, allowing the heel to score the pinfall. So I thought that was kind of a, a mistake in having those two matches back to back with a very similar finish. Yeah, I'm with you there on everything you said. I think another thing that bothered me about this one was there was really no, nothing heated about going into this at all they kind of manufactured this feud on television uh, a couple of months before and just basically you know had Wahoo and billy jack on tv defending their titles the anderson say some words about them um wahoo comes in defend another florida title Arn Arn anderson ends up fighting him for that and they just it, it, they kind of manufactured it out of the air and that, that bothered me going in but in the ring itself i mean i'll, I'll be honest Arn Oli, and wahoo i think are all great I have never been a Billy Jack Haynes fan at all, so his parts in the ring just really kill it for me, and then drags it down considerably. Yeah, and I agree. I, 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 and I still don't get the psychology or the idea of tagging the guy back in who's like, I mean, it, it actually did make sense here because he'd already been beaten up, so he was going to be pinned soon. But I don't understand the motivation of Haynes. Like, what's the thinking there? But I, I actually think it's because he just went out of stuff to do. Like, 
you know, he 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 got the hot tag, cleared house, um, and that's it. Like he doesn't have any more moves or anything to do, so he just totally tag out again. <laughs> And anyway, we have a 15 minute uh, intermission now, um, and Weaver is with JJ Dillon and uh, Buddy Landell. Actually, been quite a good night for uh, for Dillon so far, and uh, he goes as far as saying that it's the greatest night of his illustrious career. And Landell looks really happy, um, and he says that his reign, is, you know, he's going to be the national champ for a long, long time. But of course, as uh, as Brian said, he he wouldn't be. Um, in fact, it wouldn't last more than a month. I don't think. If, right. if a if a long long time is thirty days, then he was right. Uh, and, and, and JJ Dillon, I tell you what, for having the greatest night of his life, he dumped every one of these guys not less than a month later. <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. Um, so I don't know where that goes. But so I mean, the story with uh, with Landell is that he had a uh, real life drug issues. Um, but he turned up late for a TV t- t- taping. And, and in fact, I think on that taping, he was meant to be having his long built match with Flair. He, he says that the, the taping was supposed to be the angle that would kick off the series that would end up in him winning the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. Right. Okay. Um, but we don't know how, how much of that to believe. But at least he was going to go into some sort of angle with Flair. They had been teasing it because I like I said I've been watching that horseman footage from around this time and uh, there was a lot of kind of I mean it, it was kind of uh, uh, built strangely because obviously Flair would be doing his stuff and Dylan would be there with uh, Landell but Flair was kind of like the big man aloof and Landell almost like kind of like a fan it's a very strange angle yeah, they they did it for a while actually earlier in the year in the summer of '85. Uh, Buddy Landell Flair actually broke an Elvis attendance record in North Carolina. Um, I, I believe it was in July. They fought somewhere there, and um, like I said, they they broke an Elvis attendance record in that 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 town wherever it was. So they had drawn big big numbers in in the Carolinas before. So I can see them going in that direction, but uh, I guess we'll never know. Well, speaking of Elvis. Landau went back to Memphis. Did he like that? That was pretty slick. Uh, that, like you said, Dusty Rhodes would be the... He was just basically handed that national championship. Um, and it, would, would that be... Uh, did you say that was unified with the US title shortly after that? Uh, it, it wouldn't be unified until the following October. It would be... Uh, let me think off the top of my head. One, two... It would change hands technically three more times. Right. And, I mean, Landell, uh, just kind of a slightly tragic figure, I guess. I mean, he's one of wrestling's great could have been, right? No, he, uh, I really, really agree with that. He did a three-part interview on the, there was a website, uh, 57talk.com, was being done by, I mentioned the guy at the Great American Bash uh, podcast we did. He was, uh, he's a coin collector. I, I just can't think of his name. He did a three-part. Gary Cubetta. That's it. Yeah, Gary Cubetta. He did a three-part interview with Cubetta that was just, it was fantastic, because Buddy was very, very uh, self-deprecating, he was honest, he was he was very just, he knows that he screwed up a lot, and, and he gladly admits it. So, hearing all that, and then hearing him talk about missing that spot, they were going to, you know, go towards the NBA title, it, it gave it a little more credence to me as possibly being honest, because he was brutally honest with everything else. Yeah, uh, another way of looking at it is that he did have a long career. I mean, he was still, like, he, he got to have that match with Bret Hart in, what was it, 96? Like, he, he's still around, uh, kind of. So, I mean, he, you know, he could have done a lot more. Um, but, you know, he could have had a lot better career, but at least he did have a career for all that time. Whereas, uh, you know, some guys don't get a career that long. I, I guess that's the only kind of light at the end of the tunnel for him. Uh, Somewhere in dream world, Buddy Landell is defending the title against the Barbarian. <laughs> so now we get, um, well, here we go. We we have the uh, U.S. title I Quit match, Magnum TA versus Tully Blanchard. Um, and this is in Greensboro, and this is for all the marvels, as they say, this match. Um so quite a lengthy uh, angle leading into this. This is actually a continuation of the Dusty Tully feud um, over Baby Doll. Um, during that time, 
Dusty and Magnum were tagging as uh, America's team. And I, I actually watched quite a lot of that build, as I, as I mentioned last time. And um, Magnum TA was weirdly like... <laughs> he was like the guy who really wanted to support um, Dusty in his uh, quest to kind of win Baby Doll. And he really wanted to enforce it and stuff. Um, and he gets kind of um, more and more... Um, I don't know, like he gets more and more involved. Uh, and then gradually he kind of takes over from Dusty... Uh, during this feud, I'm not sure, not sure quite how it happens. Um, and then there's a very disturbing angle where he steals a kiss from Baby Doll, and David Crockett is there, and he's just screaming, "She likes it, she likes it!" And uh, That's Baby, right. Baby Doll slaps him. And uh, watching this, I mean, I was just shocked. I was like, "What the hell is going on here?" And by the way, here's my personal card. If you need me for anything, just give me a call, okay, darling? You know, it's about time that you found out what it's like to be with a real man. Yeah. really dark really dark um any 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 thoughts on that particular angle cuz uh, i get i mean i've been maintaining that tully is the, the face in this feud <laughs> this whole thing is just it, it's built so so well you know with tully stealing the title from magnum earlier in the year with baby doll dressed up as a uh, a security guard i believe in and, and she comes in the ring and costs magnum the title just the, the the brutal war words the whole way through here. Like you said, the, the kiss from Baby Doll. You know, the build of this match where, you know, I believe it's Magnum that asks for I quit stipulations. Uh, Crockett says they'll do it, but it's going to be a non-sanctioned match. And it just, they build it to being what it would become, which was just an incredible, incredible war. So, I mean, what can we really say about this match? Because... Um... You know, almost straight away they're using the cage, which uh, I've got a note here that should keep you uh, happy, Chad. Right? That was your big complaint with with uh, Steamboat and uh, Youngblood before. That's yeah, I mean, right out of the gate, they really worked the cage. Um, we had a couple of teases of Blanchard going in. That was that was the thing that I really liked the best was Blanchard teases going into the cage first and blocks it, and then just uh, since. TA into the cage, so it really builds up uh, to where you can't wait for Tully to be sent into the cage, and then it finally happens. I mean, this is a real fight, isn't it? You know, these two, these two guys are all over each other right from the very start, and it's as hate field and as brutal as, you, as you'd expect it to be, really. Um, just awesome stuff here. They legitimately look like they hate each other. Yeah. I mean, and I think more than uh, really hardly any other match I can think of is is the thing that always strikes me about this match is just the escalation of hate because at the bail, they obviously don't like each other and it's a feud, but throughout the match, I mean, you really just feel the intensity and hatred grow. Yeah. And of course it, you know, concludes with, the finish, which is pretty much epic, but uh, that was that was one thing that I really loved is that you know in the beginning of the match you certainly wouldn't call them friends, uh, but the way they built the intensity and hatred was pretty incredible. I, and I can't help but wonder, like Magnum T- um, Tully Blanchard in real life never had a relationship with Baby Doll, right? Like they weren't ever actually going out or anything. Well, I mean, I don't think officially. <laughs> I mean, you hear a lot of stuff, but, because, yeah. Uh, if, they, if they weren't, this is one of the best kind of acting jobs of any, like, rest. Like, he's really believable in the whole build to this. And, like, it's difficult, you know, this is kind of 
Savage level, you know, Randy Savage levels, plus even of, uh, like, you get the impression that he's legitimately pissed off about this. Yeah, I don't know if it was Brian or you, part that mentioned uh, Baby Doll's role in the Great American Bass Show, talk about how integral she was to Tolly in 85. But, uh, I mean, this this was really prominent here because she was excellent on the outside, you know, screaming but not being annoying and doing so and cheering on Tolly, celebrating when he'd hit big moves. Uh, she was really great. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't. That's that's exactly right. I, I, I've said a million times, uh, Tully Blanchard does not have the 85 he has in, in part of 84 even, or I'm sorry, 85 before the bash even without baby doll yeah yeah and um the microphone plays a big part in this match which is quite unusual i i guess it's you know one of the big uh novelty pieces of an i quit match so you know there's a lot of this match with one guy saying say it and the other guy saying no <laughs> so i mean the, the whole premise of this is that they have to say i quit into the microphone and the microphone itself is actually a big part of this. Not not so much even what they're saying; it's how they're saying it. It's yeah. an older mic and an '80s mic, so it's got that just kind of muffled sound because you know it's almost right in their mouth when they're saying it. And, and that added so much for me to this match of just hearing them. You know, you can hear them breathing so heavily as they're as they're yelling no, and you can hear the pain, and that just they really added a lot to the intensity. Yeah, it didn't seem cartoonish. Either I mean I know I know in the Bob Backlund Bret Hart WrestleMania I Quit match yeah. I mean it's there's a couple of instances there where it sounds really cartoonish them yelling no kind of comically here it yeah. really sounded like a battle. Well, the, the, one of the things I was going to say is that the, the kind of um, the humiliation of having to say I quit in front yeah. of an audience it, it, this really seems to get down. I don't want to get too deep here, but. Uh, this seems to get down to something primal, to something like, like, you know, I, I, I guess you'd call it the masculine ego or something. Like, it gets down to a level where this isn't just personal. This is like their manhood, their pride, everything at stake here, which is why they really don't want to say I quit. Um, and, like, it's very rare for a wrestling match to get at that kind of primal level. Does that make any sense? Would you, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, you do end up watching the end of the match. You do feel a sense of humiliation for Tully. I mean, it's amazing that you do feel, you know, embarrassed for him, and uh, it, it's it's incredible. I so, can't throw enough adjectives. So, so these guys are just a bloody mess from very early on. Um, and should we get to the should we get to the finish? Uh, basically, Tully. Um, Gets a wooden chair, um, and uh, it's not uh, it's not what I describe as a wrestling chair. It's like an old school wooden chair that you'd expect to see in a school or something. I don't know where they got this wooden chair, and he breaks it apart um, and kind of makes one takes like one of the legs or like one of the pieces of this and sort of makes it into a spike, and then he tries to uh, tries to kind of get Magnum with a spike. Um, but uh, Magnum uh, fights back and gets a hold of it, and then, you know, Jesus Christ, he, he pierces Tully's head with this piece of chair. Um, yeah, this is one of the all-time matches right here. There's nothing. I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it, it, it's just it's perfect almost in every way. The, the way they did this, and yeah, the best thing I, I always love is the fact that Tully never said I quit. That's true. I mean, he just yells out, yes. Um, I, I mean, I, my personal favorite moment is after the match where, you know, T.A. just is standing over Tully, who's a bloody mess, and, you know, has the title. And instead of giving him one last shot, he just sort of has just a look of disgust, you know, looking down at him, and then walks away and slings the belt over his shoulder. It's, it's such a triumphant a baby face move um and so i i guess i wanted to talk about like exactly where we would place this match because i know uh I, I think both me and you parv we we really like the final conflict cage match yeah I really but, but i know for me you know i didn't think it was 
one of those, you know, best of the 80s NWA contenders um, at the top level. This, I would put at the very top level. And honestly, there's only a couple of matches I can see, you know, maybe the Flare Steamboat series, maybe the I Quit Funk Flare match. But I, at worst, I would say this is right there in the discussion for me. I'm, I'm right there with you. It's 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 amazing, you know, for what it is. It's, it's just it's perfect. It's it's definitely one of the best, um, you know, Crockett matches ever, WCW matches ever. And for me, even who, like I said, I really enjoy good technical wrestling matches. I still think this is one of the greatest matches of all time. So it's yeah. it's incredible. Would you expect to see this actually place number one? Like when, when you know, I I don't know when the uh, when the uh, Crockett set is it ever going to come out but it's, it's going to be in a couple of years I, I think um, but I suspect this may be the number one when all, when all the when all the votes are totted up just because um, just because not because the most amount of people were placed at number one because this is going to be one of those matches which is in every single top five and it's usually those sort of matches that rank first right yeah, if it's not if it's not one it's going to be you know top two or three I can see like Chad said a flare steam a flare steamboat match from '89 trumping it, but other than that, no. Yeah, I, I I would say this would be the odds-on favorite for number one, uh, just basically on what you're saying, Parv, about the averages. I mean, I can see you know sort of the steamboat flare matches kind of splitting votes on some people's ballots where you know they may not like one. So somebody may have, for instance, the Shy Time Rumble match as their number one match overall. Somebody may like it the least of the three, so they put it, you know, at number 20. But I would say overall this match will be on almost everybody's top ten at least. I think the Funk Flare, I think you'll be surprised when this happens. I've got a feeling that the Funk Flare match will be the main competition for this. Yeah, I, I would put I would put that match as... I, w- I would say that match and maybe the Shy Town Rumble match. I think the Shy Town Rumble match, uh, because it's short and uh, has the victory of Steam, I would put that as the top two candidates to me that would maybe uh, contend with this match. But it's really great. Uh, the timing of the match is amazing. I mean, you had, it's, I think it's 14 minutes. Uh, so perfect timing. Uh, gave them the link to tell a great story, but didn't overstay its welcome in any bit, uh, and just really was a triumphant blow off to the feud. Now, did do you put um, the final conflict or Piper Valentine in that conversation, or do you just don't think those matches are on that kind of level? I, I mean, I know for me, like I said before on the final conflict show, I mean, I don't think final conflict will be in my top ten. When I do the set, I would be surprised if it's in my top 10, maybe top 20, top 25, but I don't think it'll be in my top 10. Uh, Piper Valentine, I can see being very high, uh, but more in the, I would say, I don't know, it's so tough with all the great matches, but I, I don't see it being a top five contender. I, I see, you know, Piper and Valentine being again like this match high pretty much consistent on everybody's ballot so it'll have a low standard deviation yeah. but I, I don't i don't see anybody putting that as like their number one for instance brian any yeah I, I agree completely yeah it, it's uh, what chad said's dead on I, I can't say it any better oh all right okay but th- th- this this current as things stand going forward this is our benchmark number one Best match yeah. so far. Without oh, yeah, without a doubt. Okay, so we're after those highs. Um, we're back to the Omni, um, and they get uh, our first look. I think at the Midnight Express with Jim Cornette. Uh, this is an Atlanta Street fight, and they're facing Chad's absolute favorite wrestler of all time, Jimmy Boogie Woogie Man Valiant. Please do not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of sad. I know in the Starcade '84 show, I went overboard. It's almost like a Dylan with a Jerry Blackwell situation. <laughs> I feel like now, where serious man love for the Boogie Woogie Man. Yeah. <laughs> 
a guilty pleasure, I would say. Certainly not my favorite wrestler, but always a good time with the Boogie Woogie Man. But he's here with his, uh, I guess, your <laughs> girlfriend at this time, Miss Atlanta Lively. <laughs> oh, man. Who is, uh, yeah, something fishy about Miss Atlanta Lively. <laughs> Um, I've got a I've got a note uh, here, and I, I actually um, made the same note again um, that I made in my original uh, review on uh, PWO. That um, while Dennis Conry looks pretty good in his tuxedo, Bobby Eaton looks ridiculous in his tu- in his tuxedo. Like he doesn't look like a guy who should be in a tux uh, at this point. Um, and um, Valley, I didn't I didn't did, did quite understand the tuxedo. Thing. I mean, I guess this was an Atlanta street fight, which but I, 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 don't, I don't know. The, the idea of a street fight is that you come in your own clothes, so obviously the Midnights are such classy guys I, that they just wear a tuxedo. You know. I mean, I can Yeah, I guess. I guess that's kind of clever, but it did seem sort of strange. Um, Valiant seems like he's lost a lot of weight here to me. He seemed really thin compared to what he usually looks like. Is that just my eyes? Yeah. I don't. I don't think he quite had as much pep in his step as uh, we'd seen before either. Uh, to me, this was. I don't know. This was on the lower end of the Valiant performances, where he was dancing and doing his thing. But whereas I thought, you know, in the Starcade '84 match, he really maximized the match with Paul Jones and yeah. made it sort of the best possible case scenario type match. This, I thought, was just sort of by the numbers, kind of comedy slash feel-good work. He was sad there was no Paul Jones this time. <laughs> I guess so. I, I mean, you would think him and Cornette would have had some fun interactions in this match, but there wasn't a whole lot there. So, uh, Valiant and, Live- and uh, Atlanta Lively have got a ballet as well called Big Mama, who's this little skinny woman. Do we know who she is? Is, is she, uh, I actually thought that she may have been Sherry Martell for a second, but uh, it's not her. Uh, did she go on to do anything, this, uh, this Big Mama? I am fairly certain. Uh, I, oh God, I wish I remember stuff talking about for real, but she is either Jimmy Vine's wife or girlfriend in real life. Oh, right, okay. Well, he's pulling well above his weight. Um, and... <laughs> And the, yeah, I mean, she's skinny in some places, but not in others. <laughs> there's, there's a uh, there's a terrific moment early on where uh, Cornette is such a such a weasel that he actually runs away from her, <laughs> which uh, which made me like just one of those little Cornette moments that uh, made me chuckle. Um, this is kind of quite messy, but um, the the Midnight's use powder. Um, they've got brass knucks hidden in there. Trunks, uh, as you'd as you'd expect from sneaky heels in a match with no rules. Um, uh, Condry whips Valiant with a belt. Um, he tries to uh, the Midnight's consistently try to undress uh, Miss Atlanta Lively. Um, I wonder who that could be. Um, they they manage to isolate her, um, uh, and Cornette nails uh, Lively with a tennis racket. Um, and then they continue to, to, to double team. Um, Valiant tries to make a comeback, and I, I notice here that even after he's beaten beaten up, um, he still kind of dances. Like so, he's taken a real beating at this point, um, but he's still kind of doing a bit of jiving as well. I think he walks around his house like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's he kind of like one of those guys who's got like who's taken too much stuff, and he's just permanently got the shakes. Like he can't. Like he's always slightly done. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, Jimmy does have his wrestling boots tattooed to his legs, so we're not we're not dealing with somebody playing with a full day. Um, I thought this was pretty entertaining. Uh, you know, it was kind of the perfect like come down type match after the after the intensity of the uh, of the Magnum TA Tully match. Um, I thought this was kind of nice little time filler, to, to, you know, to help us catch our breath and also just to have a bit of a bit of a laugh. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'm with you there until the end because uh, I don't. Uh, it's just it's bad. They don't show a lot of it, luckily. But uh, you know, Miss Atlanta Lively, uh, just it, it bleeds like a I don't know like a stuck pig at the end of this match. It's bad. 
Yeah, so, so, the, so the finish is uh, um, Miss Atlanta nails Eaton with an uppercut uh, from the top and gets the three. The faces win. And then they undress Cornette, um, which uh, faces will kind of want to do around the mid 80s. Cornette was always getting undressed, wasn't he? Um, Either that or getting his head thrown in a cake. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like you said, uh, Lively was bleeding a lot here. Um, any? When did this happen? Was this was this not planned? This uh, blade job from? Was it a blade job? Was it hard? What do they call it? Hard way? It's bleeding. Yeah, uh, my understanding was it, it was hard way. Um, he got he got hit after the match. I forget how, but oh man, he bleeds so bad in that that you know Big Mama's got what like paper towels in the ring trying to keep him from dying. It looks like. No. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Uh, no, it was bad, bad, yeah. Now, do we see Miss Atlanta Lively again <laughs> after this point? Actually, we do. I just can't remember off the top of my head when, but uh, Miss Atlanta Lively does. It's in 1987, Miss Atlanta Lively kind of returns um, when uh, Ric Flair is feuding with Jimmy Garvin for a date with Precious. Oh, right, okay. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, if anyone, uh, I guess we'll keep our uh, audience members guessing here, but uh, a little clue that maybe Miss Atlanta Lively may be the world champ one day. <laughs> Very possible. <laughs> I, I, I will say that Miss Atlanta Lively, it is a pretty good disguise in some ways. I mean, I mean, there's been some, I mean, for instance, Charlie Brown. I mean, that was... <laughs> uh, pretty ridiculous that you know the referee or any official couldn't you know realize who was under there this was not as obvious i, I think the from out of town piece is what, is what got them confused yeah yeah that i i could see that so uh, i mean moving forward we'll see a few uh wrestlers in the in disguises um right this may be up there you know i can't think of maybe flair in 96 <laughs> Um, well, oh, you talking about uncensored, where he's dressed as a woman, <laughs> and then came now that yeah, that's another good one. That's a pretty because you don't know you like you wouldn't guess. Uh, yeah, and I think there's one with actually where uh, shit, baby doll obviously does one in disguise, and there's I think there's also one with Sherry Martel down the line where she. Well, in in '94, in the on the yearbook set, uh, Sherry Martel is disguised as like a Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. Character. And that that that's on the other side of the spectrum where that looked pretty ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, and one other one that's uh a territorial thing, but uh down in uh, USWA Texas in the late eighties, uh Gary Young dresses as a woman before a match and you and it's hard to tell it's him until he gets in the ring. Yeah. I mean th- I would say this is good enough to where you know that something's, you know, awry and not what it appears to be, but it's not blatantly obvious as who is portraying, you know, the yeah. character. I, I like Tony Schiavone's uh, use of the phrase "fishy." Uh, that's, a, that's the perfect yes. word. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so anyway, um, Weaver is with Magnum TA, and he cuts a pretty good promo here, where he where he talks about the U.S. champion basically being a fighting champion's belt, and uh, obviously he's just been through a, a war to get it. Um, and it's uh, it really made me think it's a shame what happened to Magnum TA because he uh, he could have like from from this moment he could have gone on to from this point I think he could have gone on to do amazing things. Uh, yeah, I, I mean it's kind of sad because one of the things about Dusty that I always think about is I mean Dusty cut some great promos in the eighties, but quite frankly his athletic peak and then passed him by by that time so with magnum you almost feel like you were seeing you know somebody like dusty that could still cut these great fired up baby face promos but still was you know in his athletic peak so could have had the matches and the performances to sort of back it up i've got a feeling that this is it for him i mean unless we do one of those uh february 86 shows um that we were talking about brian um, He'll be at the Bash too in '86. He, he makes it to the Bash. Could it, where, when is the Great American Bash in '86? It, it, it's the summer. It's the 
the July of oh, I cannot talk. The summer of eighty six, July. Why, okay. So so we will see him one one more time. Um, yeah, and then he, he uh he goes through the the accident's in early October, so we we've got about nine, ten more months of him. Right. But yeah, I mean, this is Magnum TA on top of the world, um, and I really like that promo. Um, and I've seen quite a lot of his promos around this time, and he was he was decent, you know, he was a decent, uh, not spectacular, but solid solid enough on the on the stick, I think. Yeah, kind of coming into his own, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then we get, uh, I think we're back to uh, Greensboro, and this is the Greensboro main event. Um, interestingly, put this is the main event, not the uh, not the I Quit match. I'd have thought they would have put the I Quit match uh, last. Um, but well, considering guess, how over uh, the the one tag team is here, I understand putting them in the main event. Yeah, and also how hated the heels are too. Yes, so yes. Remember how? Uh, so this is the Rock and Roll Express um, with uh, with Don Canodal <laughs> um, versus the Russians for the for the world tag titles. In the same cage, uh, so they're getting their money's worth out of the cage. Um, and surprisingly, Nikita starts here with Ricky Morton, um, but very quickly Ivan tags in before long, and then immediately, and I've double underlined immediately, loses advantage, um, and we get our typical healing peril stuff with uh, Ivan Koloff here. Um, and I, I, I've mentioned this time and time again that Ivan Koloff always plays heel in peril, um, and Nikita's basically booked as a monster. And they play this particular story to the max in this uh, in this match. Um, we, so we get quite a long heel in per- peril section here, quick tags in and out from uh, the rock and rollers. They grab his beard at one point. Um, Coddle and Soli mentioned that must be painful. Um, Ivan can't get in any uh, offense at all. Uh, he heats the cage a few times and uh, he catches color. Uh, the crowd are pretty hot for this match. Um, finally, he gets the tag to Nikita, who uh, comes in and immediately dominates Gibson. Uh, and then, yeah, basically Gibson is playing a uh, face in peril tonight. Uh, in- which, I, which I think was a great, great change because you're. I mean, always used to Ricky being the, the face in peril. It was nice to see Robert take that for the night. Yeah, I, I've seen that a few times, you know. Gibson did the, do that uh, more than Myth would have you believe. Uh, you know, it, I mean, nine times out of ten it's Morton, but he, he did do it sometimes. Um, Nikita tags Ivan back in. Uh, I've just written why. You, you know, if you're tagging Ivan back in, you're going to lose control, <laughs> Nikita, and they even come... Uh, Ivan comes in and immediately loses advantage. It's kicked to the face. Um, he tags Nikita back in, who dominates again. Um, who tags Ivan back in, um, who misses a chump and loses advantage again. Um, however, uh, he manages to kind of stay on top. Even he, he kind of goes for what's the jump on the uh, bottom rope call, like the boss man style. Um, Jump where they where you kind of uh, try to get the leg on the pers- on the back of the person's neck. They're kind of hanging on the bottom rope. Do you know the name of that move? I, I know boss Ma- boss man is the main guy who uh, who uh, who does that move. But uh, Ivan, this is one of those. I don't, I don't know what you'd call that. You, you, you know yeah, me either. I mean, it's some some you know what it is, but I can't recall a name right yeah. now. Um. So yeah, I mean Gibson's been uh, in quite a long. This is quite a long uh, stretch sequence on uh, on Gibson here. Um, but our story is that Ivan is consistently losing the advantage, uh, and Nikita regains it again. Uh, Ivan loses it. Nikita regains it. And finally, uh, you know, this goes on for some time. And finally, Gibson gets a sneaky tag in uh, on Morton, um, who gets a flash roll up on uh, Ivan for the for the shock. Uh, well, I, I guess it's not a shock win, but it's uh, at least a, a slight upset, would we say? They make it look like a huge upset with the way he kind of sneaks it in, gets that quick sunset flip tag, and then, for me personally, what happens at the end of this match just trumps everything else because 
Nikita basically bull rushes Gibson or uh, Ricky Morton out of that cage over the top, and the two of them just beat the holy hell out of Robert Gibson. In fact, Crusher Khrushchev comes in. It's all three of like it's all three Russians beat the crap out of Gibson, um, and yeah, they know how to do a post-match beatdown. These guys. Yeah, they they just murder him. It's it's fantastic. So yeah, we got new world tag champs. Um, after any thoughts on this match? I mean, did, would you agree with me that they, they basically told a story here that there's one dominant partner and one weaker partner, and the way the R and R's were going to get the win here was to somehow isolate Ivan and long enough to get a pin on him? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think they again made Nikita look real strong. Um, I mean, he dominated in the early going. Uh, and then uh, kind of one thing with the Rock and Roll Express is just, you know, everybody knows about the Ricky Morton hot tag. So in essence, for them to build to that, Robert Gibson has to get beat up on, has to take a good bit of punishment. Um, and that this match followed that formula uh, mostly. Uh, but I, I, I like this match. I thought it was good. Um, you know, not great, but a, a very good match. And told a good story, and uh, was a real nice moment for the Rock and Roll Express to win the titles at the end. And uh, you know, didn't didn't I mean it was sort of a flash finish with a roll up, but didn't feel cheap in any way. So it was a good feel good moment at the end. And that place absolutely explodes when they yeah. win too. So that, that's a perfect way to cap off the night in that building. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we sh- we should explain uh, where the rock and rollers come from because they've been kind of doing the rounds at this point. They've been to a few territories before this, I think. I think they. Uh, they yeah, they, they were basically started? formed in Memphis. Um, they 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 stayed there for a little while, but were never really going to be the the above team. So they ended up becoming. Um, they moved over to Mid South and um, Bill Watts Mid South territory. Where they became big stars there, they had their first feud with the uh, Midnight Express, yeah. and then after that, they finally uh, showed up in Crocketland in July. And actually, their first match in uh, Crocketland was an amazing one-hour uh, worldwide match against Ivan and Crusher, where they won their first tag team titles. Right. So, and and they were mega over by this point, you know, big big stars. Uh, they were over from day one. Yeah, I mean, I I've actually watched quite a lot of that. Um... Uh, stuff in Mid South, you know, Midnight's versus uh, Rock and Roll Express, and uh, yeah, if you haven't seen that stuff, it's uh, definitely worth tracking down. Um, and this is not actually it for the Russians; they stick around uh, a fair bit longer, um, so that they're not they're not out of it yet. Um, and uh, that is actually strongly suggested by the fact they get they get to retain their heat at the end here um, with this uh, beatdown. So yeah, great. Uh, we now we're going over back to the Omni for the uh, for the main event, and it's uh, Ric Flair versus Dusty Rhodes again, um, and uh, this is for the world title. No million dollars at a stake this time this this time this time around, but there is a story going in that Dusty has uh, had his ankle injured, um, basically by the Andersons a couple of weeks beforehand. Um, and this is quite, you know, talked about in the build as well. So Flair's obviously got a game plan going into this match. Um, he knows like that there's one body point to work, uh, body part to work on. Um, quite tentative um, start to this match, and it kind of does feel like quite a big deal. You know, when Flair comes out, it always feels like a big deal. Not quite as big as when he uh, got the helicopter ride in. But, you know, that that was massive. But um, yeah, I mean, it it was Chad. It was a big, uh, it felt like a big deal, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it it definitely did. Um, I I think this was a, a good match at this time that sort of re-escalated the feud between the two. Um, for sort of a modern comparison, I kind of compare it to when. Uh, Austin and Rock fought each other at WrestleMania 17, where they'd had previous matches together. But this this really felt like, you know, kind of the culmination of their feud, for better or worse. 
Yeah, and I mean, it it had a kind of it was a tentative start, I'd say, where both guys are kind of feeling each other out. Um, Dusty's really got kind of like his game face on. He's not really doing a lot of shucking and jiving tonight. He's focused on winning the world title. Um, Flair also obviously doesn't want to lose. Um, uh, I've got to note that there's one really, really annoying fan in the crowd during the show who does like this really loud, high-pitched kind of oo sound. I don't know if uh, you guys noticed that. Did you? Uh, could you hear that guy? He was really bugging me all the way through. Yeah, that that was my father-in-law, actually. That was your father-in-law? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been a turn up for the bugs. <laughs> but you, you, you know the guy I'm on about, right? Yeah, there, there, there was. I do. I did notice that it was kind of. I don't. I mean, I don't even know. It was sort of. I mean, it was kind of like he was just wanting to hear himself yell. Yeah, but wasn't like, necessarily partisan. I don't know what he was doing like for the rest of the night, but he he only really uh, starts being really loud during this match and uh, quite annoying. Um. Dusty gains the early advantage and works on Flair's leg. Um, and d- d- this goes on for some time. He basically takes out Flair's leg early on. Uh, and Flair sells this injury for, you know, the early portion of the match. Um, and... Uh, well, what else happens here? Um, basically, Dusty uh, goes for the figure four and re-injures his ankle um, going for the figure four. And this kind of gives gives Flair the opening he needs to get on top himself. And now he repeatedly tries to go for the figure four. And that's really the story of this match. So both guys have injured legs by this point, And it's who can sink in that figure four. Um... Well, that's kind of how it's worked. Um, Flair is uh, bleeding, um, I notice, and I uh, I was wondering why isn't why isn't Tommy Young stopping this match? Um, <laughs> where's where's Smoking Joe Fraser to to lay down the law? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's you, you. You can bleed in Atlanta, but not in Greensboro, apparently. <laughs> or or with Smoking Joe as the ref. Yeah, um, the loud fan is driving me crazy at this point. Um, and uh, Flair really starts to work on the leg. Um, and he gets the figure four locked in. Um, and of course, like with any other time that... Uh, like with any other time that uh, Flair gets the figure four on, Dusty reverses it. And I've just uh-huh. got the uh, note here. Why does like why does Rick bother with this move? <laughs> I know it's his famous move, but... Um, like even by this point, he never wins a match with this thing. He only beats jobbers with a figure four. <laughs> any, any any ideas, Jeff? <laughs> well, that yeah, that is kind of. I mean, one of the criticisms that you have is how Flair, you know, does use the figure four to, at the very best, very minimal. Uh, results you know a lot of times it gets reversed almost exclusively and and really i think you know flair who i think is one of the greatest wrestlers of all time but if you do want to criticize him he does have quite a repertoire of offensive moves that never work especially the figure four and then the uh, fly off the top rope which i know you can't argue and say some of his biggest wins did come off of using those moves but yeah. It's it's definitely a, a low percentage of accomplishment when he performs these moves. He hits it against uh, Nikita that uh, um, hit 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 to move off the top rope uh, against Nikita yeah. and against. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen a couple of times where he's gotten the crossbody. I mean, the Starcade '83 finish was, you know, his crossbody with. Race sort of tripping over Kanetsky. So, I mean, that that definitely was an important match, an important moment where he won. But, I mean, me personally, if only as succeed in something one out of, at best, probably every ten times, I think I would scratch that and come up with something else. It, the figure four is probably, the Flair's figure four is probably the least, um, least well-protected finisher of all time. 
Yeah, I mean, I would I would say you know a lot of that has to do with the history. I mean, there's so much history, so much flair on tape yeah. that you know it it really gets magnified. But for I can't think of offhand anything else that's. I mean, certainly any baby face move or even, you know, the pile driver by Lawler or some of the other big moves. I mean, maybe the only, only thing I can think of is in the, the Japanese sense, the uh, tiger driver that Masawa yep. uh, used. I mean, that in towards the later end of the nineties and into the thousands was just a throwaway move, which, you know, in the beginning of his run would be a finisher, but, I, I don't think that was as abused as the figure four. The, the only two examples I throw out there is uh, Brandy Savage's elbow. I think because uh, he, he he hits literally five of them on Hogan and he still gets up. Yeah, and Warrior and uh, WrestleMania uh, seven too. Uh, so uh, that's Warrior, yeah. that's two big examples. And then the other one would be uh, Tito Santana's flying burrito. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tito. I mean, when he would hit that, most of the time the guy would roll out to the outside, which I guess is cheap, but doesn't totally diminish the move. But yeah, player, I mean, every time he'd lock in the figure four, he'd reverse it. Uh, this match, in a lot of ways, you know, last year at Starcade, we saw them essentially do a sprint in 12 minutes where Dusty was putting on the figure four about three minutes in, and it really didn't come together. Here, I mean, the, the pace is methodical, and I, I mean, I, I kind of struggle, honestly, would rather I call this match good or not, but I did think they told a lot better story here than the previous year. They, they worked it very stiffly, I noticed. I mean, there was a, the, the strikes were stiff when they did. Yeah, uh, hit Dusty's strikes especially, I thought, like his sort of, his, I guess, juking and jiving, punching. When he was rocking, and then before he'd go into the elbow, I thought those looked really good. And what did you think of the general kind of psychology of Dusty, like Dusty going in with a hurt leg? So his strategy was to take out Flair's leg to make it. Yeah, kind of like- I mean, I was I wasn't crazy about that, but I did think the announcers helped put over that strategy and kind of going like an eye for an eye route um, as far as getting over, you know, what he was trying to accomplish. Yeah, d- Brian, any thoughts before we go into the finish here? No, I think we've lost him. Okay. Yeah. The, the, there's a storm in Pittsburgh, and uh, I think we've lost Brian temporarily. Um, so anyway, we, there's a big comeback from uh, from Dusty, and he hits a, a big flying clothesline. Um there's a pin up, there's a pin attempt and basically uh Flair pushes Dusty up um from this pin attempt and uh he pushes him so hard that Dusty lands on Tommy Young and Tommy Young is out here. Um and he rolls out uh, to outside of the ring. And I couldn't help but notice that uh <laughs> when Tommy Young is out there some fan throws a can at him and <laughs> I I laughed at that. On an uh, only come out for the sneak attack. This will become significant a little bit later on. Um, and Dusty basically fights off uh, both Arn and Oli. Um, I think Oli does nail him, but uh, um, Dusty reverses um, whatever Flair was up to there, and the nether ref is out and gets the pin. We have a new world champ. I, I may have fluffed that finish there. Did I say everything right? It was a little bit... Yeah, I mean, that's essentially what happened. Uh, you know, Young gets bumped. Uh, we got sort of Oli and Arn sneaking attack, which plays off the, you know, the angle in the cage where they attack Dusty. Dusty thwarts that off and then gets the pinfall for a, uh, what at this time felt like a really triumphant moment at the end of his career. And uh, it's just, I guess, I guess we can maybe talk about what ended up happening, but it's just really baffling how they decided to take the title away from him. I thought that, in retrospect, and really watching this show was a, a terrible decision. Yeah, so, so this is probably one of the most famous uh, dusty finishes, as, uh, as they're known. 
um, the dusty finish is when um, we think there's been a title change, but then usually due to ref shenanigans, um, something happens to uh, reverse the decision. And that's what happens uh, the night after uh, basically Tom Young came out, said well, he was the official ref, and um, he was knocked out. I don't know why the other ref bothered coming out. If, if that was the case, you know, if that is what referees uh, think like. And the official decision is that because of Arn Anderson's interference, um, there was the, you know, the decision should have been a DQ. So Ric Flair is still champ. Uh, right, which is, I mean, it's just, the main problem I have with that is, it's just not very consistent. I mean, some, it's just not consistent. Sometimes you have it uh, where they won't reverse it, and, you know, the flip side, if the heels attack and win, you know, you never see that getting reversed either, hardly. So it's it's just inconsistent, it really ruins a good moment for Dusty, and, I mean, in a lot of ways, it really, to me, deflates a lot of momentum, honestly, that Crockett had been sort of building up. I know 86 was hot for him and uh, and through that, but I, I do feel like there was a good bit lost here. Yeah, I mean, one, one, of, the, um, one of the reasons for this, I think, the real-life reason, is that they want to send the fans home happy, um, but for whatever reason, they don't want to put the title on Dusty long term. Like, uh, Flair is a convenient world champ for many reasons, right? Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just tough. I mean, I guess they were still in the mindset of not thinking of these shows as, you know, their end-all, be-all shows, even though they would load up the cards. Um, I mean, because it's, you know, the 80, Starcade 84 and the Starcade 85 finish both have sort of a house show feel where it almost feels like they're building up for, you know, next month's Omni show in a lot of ways. And that just, that's one thing you can say about Vince is, from from WrestleMania on, you had hardly any you know terrible finishes on pay per views, uh, and the ones that were terrible you can really recall vividly because they were so few and far between, like the Yoko Lex SummerSlam '93 debacle. But yeah. at that time, that's the first one I can really think of, and that's eight years into him promoting these super shows. No, I think you're right there, and it's, I mean that's one of the many things that I think uh, Vince kind of you know deserves credit for that he he was able somehow to send fans home happy while at the same time um, kind of planning long term, whereas this seems like they weren't able to do both. Right. So anyway, F- Flair is absolutely pissed, as you can imagine. Um, and I, I think they may even slightly tease what's going to happen. That um, you know, Flair's annoyed about the other ref. I mean, it's not explicitly stated, but it's hinted at that he, you know, he gives a look towards Tommy Young and he's pissed off about something. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if they were supposed to build it up more, but I, I did notice that. But it was uh, very subtle, as you talked about. Yeah. Um, and I've got a note here that, um, and I, I felt this both times. I felt it more the first time I watched the show. I felt it less this time, but um, I still kind of, kind of agree with my original um, idea that the other, obviously, the other faces come out to to, to celebrate with Dusty his big title win. Um, quite, quite funnily, they struggle to lift him up. They try to. Yeah, that that was a nice moment <laughs> where they kind of. <laughs> Try to lift him up on his shoulders, but he's he's sort of rocking back, and it, it, it didn't it is, look good. It's funny. Who, who are they? Like Rocky King and uh, Sam Houston? Yeah, or whatever. yeah. Not exactly the A-listers came out here. But um, like when they're back in the uh, when they're back in the locker room, um, I really have a feeling that there's no real emotion from the other guys. They don't they don't seem that happy for him. Tony Schiavone seems really happy, but. The other guys don't seem like I don't know. They don't seem as pleased as they should do for some reason. I mean, maybe it's because um, 
maybe it's because Dusty was kind of like their boss in a weird way. So it was kind of like they didn't seem they didn't seem very convincing to me um, that they were really happy that this guy just won the world world title. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely say that Flair's celebration at the end of Starcade '83 was one seemed more genuine, and two was more triumphant as far as backstage with him and Steamboat and Youngblood yeah. uh, all together. It, you just don't get the impression that these uh, group of jobbers are big mates with uh, with Dusty, right? And right. Wa- Wahoo McDaniel can't even crack a smile. Seemingly, <laughs> he's just got his normal kind of. Uh, our face there. Um, so anyway, uh, Tony and uh, Coddle are basically, you know, they feel confident enough at this point to say, see you for Starcade 86. And uh, I guess we will. <laughs> we will see them for Starcade 86. And what well, what did you think of the Dusty Flare match? I mean, would you call that a good match? Decent match? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm really undecided on uh, Dusty versus uh, Flare. For me, it never really feels. How can I put it? Um, I mean, not... it, to me, it almost feels underwhelming every time. I mean, you have sort of the quintessential heel of the '80s and Flair, and the quintessential babyface and Dusty, and they really were the two pillars of the promotion for such a long time. But they don't seem to have that great chemistry together. I I don't think they've got great chemistry. Um, I I think it's a case. I, I think Dusty versus Flair is really the best example of um, guys talking the fans into a stadium. You know that feud was all about the promos. You know you, you put you put hard times on Dusty Rhodes or all of the classic uh, Flair promos leading up to this match. Um, it's much less about what actually happened in the ring. Um, right. And yeah, I I really don't think that we get. I I prefer this match to the to the last match. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because there was a little bit more to it, but I still thought that it's really not. You know, it's it's struggling to make three stars in my book. You know. Yeah, it it'll be interesting to me to see if this makes the Crockett eighty set. Um, I, I mean, I know uh, that Chris Zellner. Uh, really likes this match, and he's usually on the committee. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I kind of see this match with a lot of dissenting opinion. It's hard for me to think that this would be a match talked about in the same sort of terms as some of the other matches. Like, do people really think highly of the Dusty versus Flair stuff? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I know this match in particular has some pretty, uh, you know, has some people champion it. Um, I, I would say, you know, without seeing the Great American Bash match, uh, I would say this would be the one they have the greatest chance of making it onto the set with. But uh, I don't, I don't know. I can see it kind of coming down to the wire. Somebody maybe having to use a personal pick if they want to, and then, you know, I don't think it'll fare well. But I do see some people having it relatively high. No, I don't mind catching flack for this, but I have never been a fan of uh, of Dusty. Um, I know a lot of people uh, high on Dusty Rhodes. He's obviously a tremendous, uh, tremendous promo, um, and I don't think anybody can take that away from him. Especially around this time, he was cutting some of the best uh, promos that anybody will ever cut. Um, but as an in ring performer, there's something that's not like. Uh, it doesn't do it for me, you know. Um, I, I agree. I mean, great, great promo, uh, so far wrestler. I, I, I mean, I like Dusty's persona and his demeanor, but what you were saying before, I think, is is very, very true in that, you know, he talked people into the building just based off his promos. I mean, I, I can give you the example of my father-in-law and brother-in-law with this show, um, you know, my dad. Even though he wasn't a huge wrestling fan growing up, he he really liked Dusty when I was a kid. Um, you know, even when I watched him in his WWF days with Sapphire, he was always big on Dusty. Of course, impersonated his accent. Um, so I, I do think Dusty is kind of one of those figures that 
he really sort of ignore the matches and just look at his promos to build a case for him. But overall, I don't think he's, a, you know, certainly not a great wrestler. But, but. Well, here's the controversial thing for me, because I think I'm actually lower on Dusty than a lot of people. Um, and I would actually take a Hogan match over a Dusty match. Um, and I, I can see that being a controversial opinion in, in some quarters, given how formulaic most Hogan matches are. But Yeah, that, that'd that be interesting. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I tend to... I think I'd lean towards Hogan, too, with what I've seen. But I actually think Hogan was... Uh, was like, I actually think Hogan is really good at doing uh, little things like garnering uh, sympathy from the crowd. and He's actually better at selling than uh, than is often credited for. Um, and even though he works that same formula over and over, I actually think that what Hogan does, he did pretty well. Um, d- d- for me, there's something about Dusty that's not that's not working. Um, I, mi- I mean, like if it doesn't work against Flair, who is it going to work against? That's why I'm. That's why I wonder. Right. So, yeah, like so, not the not the best. Uh, uh, not the best finish um, to the show for me, and I think we've actually got Brian back. Hold on, let me call him. He may, may be back in time for the awards. <laughs> Hello, Brian. Hey guys. Hi, hi, Brian. We're we're, we're still here. Um, we were just uh, we've just been talking about um, the Dusty uh, Dusty Flare match, and uh, we've pretty much um, been through it. And we were both, you know, talking about how it's neither of us are particularly high on that match and I am not particularly high on Dusty so um, a, you know great promo not great in the ring for me so yeah I, I agree completely w- w- any thoughts on this particular match um, you know um, n- nothing special it, it, it's by the numbers Dusty and Flair um, they've had much better and they would have much better in 1986. So, yeah, I, I kind of like you guys said, uh, it's, it's nothing that I would write home about the, the storyline leading up to it was so much better than this. And plus, you know, we get the original dusty finish. Yeah. And we, we would, um, I mean, I was basically saying that the, the reason for this dusty finish is because, um, they wanted to leave the fans going home happy but they, for whatever reason, wanted to keep the belt on flare long term. Yeah, and God forbid you make your champion look strong. Yeah, well, I mean, did, can you see a case for flag going over, like clean, or just going over on the show? I mean, maybe if you had uh, Ole and Arn come in with the ref down, knock Dusty out, and pin him, you pretty much get the same effect. Yeah. And... Uh, just before you came on, I was saying that I probably go as far, I'm probably lower on Dusty than a lot of guys are, and I would probably go. Um, I probably pick a Hogan match over a Dusty match. Like if you ask me, even though Hogan matches are really formulaic and stuff, and I was wondering where you where you would come down on that if it was a yeah. Uh, today, I would agree with you. Um, I'd much rather see a Hogan than a Dusty match, but uh, in 1986. I, I love Dusty Rhodes. He could do no wrong when I was eight years old, so I would have much rather have seen a Dusty match at, at that period in time by far. Dusty, to me, like was Hulk Hogan back then. Okay. All right, you well, can imagine that. You, Brian, you've actually come back in time for our end-of-show awards. So, uh, great. Um, match of the night, I think, is pretty obvious. So I'm wondering if we should pick a second-best match of the night. In, in fact, before we even do that, um, I thought it might be fun to um, for us to pick which show we'd rather be at, the Greensboro show or the Omni show. Ooh, that's pretty tough. So, I mean, just to recap, the Greensboro show is basically Crusher Crucia versus Sam Houston, Ron Bass versus Black Bar, and then the J.J. Dillon stuff, Landell versus Taylor, Magnum T.A. versus Tully, and then the Rock and Roll Rollers versus uh, the Russians, and then the Omni is Manny Fernandez versus Abdullah, Billy Graham versus the Barbarian arm wrestling, and then a proper match. Uh, Oli and Arn versus Wahoo McDaniel and Billy Jack Haynes, um, Jimmy Valley and Miss Atlanta Lively versus the Midnights, and then Dusty versus Flair. 
I can tell you right away for me, it's not even close. It's Greensboro. It's got my three favorite matches of the night all in one place. So I would be at a Greensboro in a heartbeat. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think running down that card really in that way, the way Par just did it really shows how strong Greensboro card portion was, but also shows how good, you know, WrestleMania two is such a debacle going through all three locations, but here it really worked with them sort of flipping back and forth. So it, you know, I'd have thought the Omni card was stronger till you actually read out the six matches or, you know, six things that consisted on that card. Yeah, or WrestleMania 2 is just a, it's a nightmare top to bottom. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions in there, but yeah, overall, it doesn't compare to this at all. Right. Yeah, I, I think the things like just, just having one commentary team, you know, just things like right. that made it less of a clusterfuck. And uh, I actually thought their taste, their, their sequencing of the matches was pretty much spot on on this night you know for example like putting that um valiant atlanta lively midnight match right after the i quit match you know as a little sandwich be- before the main event i thought was uh was pretty good you know like the crowd needed to come down uh in greensboro before the main event um for that match you know i thought it was pretty and obviously the omni crowd needed something to do so <laughs> Um, yeah, I thought that was pretty decent. It, it actually went out live, right? So when um, when the Omni matches were happening in Greensboro, they had it on the live feed. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I did ask my father-in-law on that, and he said it was on sort of the scoreboard. So it, it was almost like the Greensboro portions were closed-circuited into the Omni and vice versa. Right. That, 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 that's a pretty cool way to do it as well. So yeah, I mean, obviously either of these cards blow away any of the little mini cards from WrestleMania 2. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a no-brainer, isn't it? You'd want to be at Greensboro. Sorry. Uh, oh yeah. Sorry to your family uh, members there, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, the m- match of the night I think is obvious. Um, so I think possibly more interesting is second best match of the night. For me, it's because... Go ahead, Brian. Oh. Yeah. Okay, uh, for me, uh, well, this is going to be a very unpopular decision, but I just love Buddy Landell and Terry Taylor. Yeah, I can that, def- that's, that's my number two. I can definitely see a case for it. Chad? Um, again, I think it may be controversial, but I may actually be leading towards Abdullah versus Manny Fernandez. <laughs> and you would agree with Manny. <laughs> You know, I, I thought you were going to say the Jimmy Valiant match for a second. I was like, you know, just your fandom's getting out of control. But <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'm. For me, it's between the Landell Taylor and the uh, and the cage match, the tag cage match, Rock and Roll Express versus the Russians. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to go with the tag match. Uh, just because it told a very neat story there, and the post-match beatdown was cool, yeah. and it was a big that, moment as well for the Greens. That'd player. be my number three. Yeah. That'd yeah. Be oh, yeah. Me too, without a doubt. So yeah, pretty strong card, all in all. Probably the best show we've. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that Great American uh, Bash '85, if we had the full version, would be running this close. Um, but yeah, this is a best show we've done so far. I think uh, in terms in terms of a card from top to bottom. Uh, Without a doubt. So our MVP, um, Tully? I would would say Magnum and Tully together, because when when you think Starcade, you think that match. Yeah, I I would agree with that. I mean, Tully was great. Um, I sort of expect that from Tully in a lot of his big matches. Uh, Magnum really rose to the occasion here, and I thought he was wonderful. Also, yeah, I'd I'd, I'd actually like to give a little uh, little shout out to uh, uh, Landell and Taylor as well. I thought they were really good in their match. I mean, obviously neither of them were MVP tonight, but uh, they deserve a mention at least. Um, right. And uh, yeah, Miss Atlanta Lively as well. <laughs> um, so. What do we call it? Least MVP, least uh, least valuable player. Yeah, I, I mean, I, to me, there's only really one contender, and even though 
he was better than he had been. I think uh, for the hat trick, I would have to go with Billy Graham on his third show in a row. I'm with you there. We need to rename this the uh, Billy Graham Least Valuable Player Award. <laughs> yeah, the Billy Graham Least Valuable Player. I do actually think he has competition tonight, and I may be controversial and uh, give my pick to someone else, um, as I tried to do last time, but failed. I think Billy Jack Haynes is pretty, pretty <laughs> shitty in that match. Um, That's not a bad choice. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of Billy Jerk stuff in that match was, uh, to quote Bobby Heenan, um, was it, it was hidden a lot because he was with three other good guys. I think that might have might have saved him from from getting my worst wrestler award. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's got to be Billy Graham, is not it? Let's, to, to make it official, the Billy Graham award. Um, and is that is that that's it? I think, isn't it? That's the, those are the those are the awards we give. Um, so yeah, all in all, it, Good, good card. So, w- what do we, uh, what do we have to look forward to for 1986? There's the, there's the Great American Bash. There's Starcade next year. And are we going to have a look at one of these February shows? Uh, uh, the, the, there was the, the famous uh, Superstars on the Super, super Station match, which uh, was on in February of that year, which was a fantastic show. Uh, Midnight's and Rock and Rolls were on there. Um, Nature Boy Ric Flair's taking on Ron Garver for the title. We're getting another Dusty Tully match. And I believe the uh, Road Warriors take on the uh, Russians. So it, it's a really good match that I know TBS had uh, been promoting as being live, but it definitely wasn't live when they showed it. And uh, it's a really good show, and it's well worth taking a look at. And also, in 1986 alone, there is a ton of really good television matches, especially on the Worldwide and Pro shows. Um, I... There, there's so many of them I can't even think of them off, you know, off the top of my head. I could reel probably ten of them off there. It's just an incredible year for television, at least in my opinion. What I think we should do is maybe take a show to um, take a look at that um, Superstation uh, show if it's available. Is it available, Brian? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's complete. It's available complete. Yeah, so yeah. maybe we can take a show to look at that and maybe like highlight some other cool stuff that was going on in '86. Then Great American yeah. Bash, then uh, then Starcade. Take our take our time a little bit because, uh, like you said, I mean, JCP is really ramping up now. It's really starting yeah. to hit its stride by this point. This is to me, this is their best year coming up, at least during the Crockett years. Uh, that I know a lot of people love '89, but '86 uh, is phenomenal. All right, guys. Any, any other thoughts here? Or should we wrap up? I have nothing. Uh, just a great show that I really enjoyed. I know I said in the Starcade 84 show, it took me multiple settings to get through this one, uh, to get through that show. And this one, I watched the opener and then I had to do some stuff. But then I came back and watched the whole show start to finish and enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm right there with Chad. This is just a fantastic wrestling show, top to bottom. I don't know if JCP has a better top to bottom show. Again. Again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how's your how's, how's your house, Brian? Have you been hit by lightning or are you all right? It's it's a mess. That's why my power went out the one time, and I can hear it starting to clip again now. So who knows? Uh, all right, guys. Well, 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 thank you very much, and I uh, look forward to doing this again. All right. See you guys. All right, fellas. Have a good night. Well, by the way, here's my personal card. If you need me for anything, just give me a call. Okay, darling. You know, it's about time that you found out what it's like to be with a real man. Yeah. For all of us here at WCW Center Stage, for Cowboy Bill Watts and the American Dream Dusty Rhodes, I'm Jim Ross saying good night, everybody.